Thank you again for joining us. So we are in Zoom 3 transmissions, um, and I just wanted to share, I guess, some thoughts as one of the moderators tonight uh, together with Chu Tao of HKU. So first transmissions, it's defined as processes of conveying and spreading signals and data through radio waves, space, or medium. And this is the theme for Zoom 3, and it's a del very deliberate association with communication networks as a model for architectural practice, which we, which we think uh, is characteristic of the work of Archigram, a name for the collective zine that threaded the word architecture and telegram. Zoom 3 transmissions builds on the last two panels on inhabitations and figurations. Uh, such thematic framing of our discussion is not meant to be an exhaustive or a clo cloistered kind of way of reflecting on Archigram's practice. Rather, it's based on the submissions from a, from a call for papers, as well as our invitation to those whose research and design practice have been stimulated by Archigram's propositions. Nevertheless, uh, the three sessions so far uh, present key overlapping attributes that have shaped and contributed to Archigram's distinct methodology and, le and legacy as architectural adjutants. Inhabitations considers Archigram's prescient uh, proposals on how humans could inhabit the city on the level of systems, building clusters, and bodily interface. Figurations presents the means and implications of Archigram's various architectural representations through the interplay of texts, found imagery, and drawings in their publications, as well as the multimedia, atmosphere-driven exhibitions. For today, Transmissions continues our interest in exploring how Archigram's figurations, as well as international lecture circuit and pedagogical platforms like Archigram Opera, which we'll present this Friday, have directly or indirectly been circulated, assimilated, copied, or even misinterpreted, resulting in reciprocities as much as dissonance in the discourse and production of architecture and urbanism across geographies and time. Tonight, we'll also consider the, the we'll firstly consider the claim of Hong Kong as an archigram city as basis of framing the 2019 Hong Kong Biennale of Urbanism uh, and Architecture. And this is gonna be through a brief sharing by the Biennale's chief curator, Roger Wu. Secondly, Ariel Gennad will reveal the affinities as well as the gaps between archigrams, as well as Isozaki Arata's practice of dissolutioning or expanding architecture. And thirdly, Evangelos Kotsiaris will reveal how archigrams work were surreptitiously republished amongst state architects in the Soviet Union. These papers reinforce the spread of, as well as parallels to Archigram's architecture of change. Amongst what Archigram calls the International Network of Experimental Architects, as published in Archigram number nine, but this spread is also amongst those whose work Peter Cook would later consider in our video response, not worth the slot. So uh, basically we believe that such dissonance makes it so apt for Mark Wigley to close the session with retransmitting Archigram. We have not seen Mark's paper, but in his abstract, his suggestion of how the Archigram show is now shifting network is somehow timely. Archigram has often been the source of transmission, but in an increasingly hyper network world of mediating information, Archigram also becomes only one of the nodes within a larger network. It makes M plus this event or even each of its participants, all nodes of their own, exercising the, the, the retransmitting of Archigram. And so this shift, uh, I find, is more evident at a time when there is increasing awareness of values no longer ascribed according to a single aesthetic or ideological registers of a particular profession, particular institution, or even nation, in such a way that the value of the discussions uh, tonight or even the last two sessions is pretty much regardless of Archigram's less than favorable response, uh, but they lie in what they reveal of other conditions of production, consumption, and mediation of architecture that are beyond the times and context in which Archigram had operated. So we hope the past three sessions, um, what I, I would consider as situated readings of Archigram, can be the beginnings of encouraging a multiplicity in interpreting and enacting whatever Archigram's work has been. Whether these could result from either glitches, unexpected mutation, or faithful replication of ideas of Archigram, in this seemingly unhindered flow of information, we hope that this would really help expand our views, not just of archigram or architecture, but of the forces at work that could limit or flourish us. So with this, I'll just um, invite our first speaker, Roger Wu, um, to talk to us about what it means to be inspired to have archigram, uh, Hong Kong as archigram city as the basis of, your, of the Biennale. Thank you, Roger. 
Um, thank you very much, um, Shelley. Uh, um, first of all, I just would like to say that that um, I'm extremely nervous about giving this talk because I think uh, uh, I always felt that I'm a bit more of a joker in the pack in that you know it's, it's not research based or or, 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 or academic or, or scholarly, but but it's based on a certain experience I've had through the uh, Biennale, and I, I, I love to share it with you and uh, and. And um, it is very brave of you, Shelley, to, to, to give me the platform to, to share my thoughts. So, so here we go. Two by two is, in fact, the title of the Biennale of this year and how, how we, we're trying to forge a connection between two by two and the archigram spirit, what I call the archigram spirit in, in Hong Kong. And um, the news uh, sort of back in early 2019 came through and, uh, you know, a lot of us started thinking, particularly um, some of us, um, like me, who, who actually educated in the UK, and really kind of thought, well, what, what does it actually mean? Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, and 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 it, around the same time, it's when the idea of the Biennale starts to come through about uh, imagination, is about innovation, about, and it is the imagination of our city build, uh, future city builders, how to innovate, and and I think, and 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 funny enough, the two kind of come through, and. It, 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 in a way, um, actually, in Hong Kong, there has been quite a lot of these um, connections with Archigram. I mean, you know, throughout in the last few years, there's been exhibitions. You know, as you can see, people, uh, you know, the, the Archigram team was here. You know, signing autographs and meeting uh, people in Hong Kong. Uh, in fact, in the 2015 Biennale, we've also had a, a sellout talk by Peter Cook about the sit about um, uh, visions of the future in, in, in Hong Kong. So, so we, you know, they're not strangers here. And even um, after the, um, in the December, after the Biennale, uh, after the, sorry, the um, announcement, there was a ball, um, as you can see, um, very glamorous, <laughs> Peter and, 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 and co, um, that attended in December, which was uh, um, to greet our design community. So, um, I, and I think um, at the same time, when we started talking about the Biennale, we talked with a lot of uh, people involved and and a few people a, a, a number of questions uh, uh, you know sort of came up uh, namely um why uh, uh, you know why the archigram collections in hong kong in particular what are the connections and 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 you know what what's his reaction like in the in the uk and what what should our response in the hong kong be in a way those are very kind of interesting questions but but they were not funny enough we, we all kind of agree that they weren't necessarily the important kind of um, questions. And so what the idea was that back in late March, originally, we were planning a uh, symposium called the Archigram Spirit as part of the uh, Biennale, hopefully to get the designers in Hong Kong to really have a discussion about, you know, their experience or, 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 or you know, what, what we can do to take this forward in the context of Hong Kong and in the context of, of, you know, Hong Kong in terms of architecture as well as urbanism and use the Biennale as a, as a platform, as a springboard to really start that discussion with the, with the grounded level, the people who, who are, who are at the end of the day uh, has the future of our city in, in mind. And I wouldn't read the quote, Tim Stoner, one of our um, international curatorial advisors, you know, gave this quote and I mean, in his, in his mind, only Hong Kong epitomized sort of, um, you know, a, 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 the city, very much like uh, um, how it was envisaged by uh, envisioned by Archigram in some ways, the walkways, you know, the the the, um, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, and, and and so on and so forth. So so it is with this kind of context we look at these um, uh, uh, yeah, sort of Archigram um, drawings, designs, um, systems, and so on and so forth, and and we start talking to to the designers, the exhibitors, and we collected a number of quotes and. And funny enough, there are a few things which um, kind of spring, spring to mind. And, and as, as, as you can see from the quote here, some of us were actually taught by Archigram, um, but some of some um, like, uh, like me, although I wasn't sort of directly taught by any of them, but I was in the UK and I almost absorbed it by osmosis. The reason being that actually where it came from in the UK, there is a context. Um, there is a, 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 an ecology, which is a very broad from the very, Kind of pragmatic to the very imaginative, but within that, even within that spectrum, people kind of appreciate and analyze and and and, and respect what's happening in different kind of um, uh, uh, you know different designers from different perspective. And it is within that that's very very clear. That's from from the discussion with the various um, contrib contributors to the Biennale. That's a very key component of how it kind of affected us. Um, 
and also there are others. I mean, you know, in a minute you will also see some of the work. For example, the, for example, Anthony Co. Um, actually, it was interesting seeing some of the submissions for the uh, call for drawings, and and um, I recognize some of the names. And in fact, like like um, Anthony, you know, he he was very much um, uh, 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 um, attracted not by the drawings themselves, but in the way. It's what behind the drawing, the thinking process, and also the you know the, the message behind, and that's for 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 a lot of us is the key of what is actually uh, important. It's not so much the image itself, and 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 finally, um, you will also see Rick, um, uh, one of the um, curator, uh, the other contributors, work later on in that. How does it many you know you know not, not having influence by it, how does it manifest, manifest themselves in the designs in the in the proposals that they make. And it, you know about technology, about you know sort of about the the, the vision of the future, and then all of this um, we want to we wanted to explore in the um, Biennale. But unfortunately, um, because of COVID nineteen, we were unable to have that Biennale. So, but the conversation carried on. So we um, we had uh, you know we've had a number of discussions over the phone, over Zoom, and people exchange some ideas. And in a way, in, in the next um, remaining sort of eight or nine minutes or so, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you some of the the key. Or, or let's say the you know findings that 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 we um, come to. The biggest questions out of all this is what's next. I mean, we now we now know that that the collection's here, the M plus, and uh, what can we? How can we make, make the most of it? And I think the two things are, are are very very clear to to us as those those of us who were involved with the Biennale is that you know how do we and get inspired by by this to inform the evolution of the Hong Kong design e ecology. Um, in, in so far as I think um, we talked about the fact that it doesn't matter which spectrum, which end of the spectrum from the design ecology you're in from the UK, you, you either absorb it directly, you know, you went to the likes of the AA, the, 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 the Bartlett and so on, you know, there is very much as part of the curriculum to be kind of, you know, to analysis and, and, and so on. So for some were even taught directly by Peter as well as the, uh, uh, David and people. But whereas from the other aspects, even though I was never directly involved with it um, or, or taught by, by these people, I was kind of understood, well, I don't know why, by, by osmosis or, or whatever. You, there is a culture within a very healthy design ecology whereby the, the, it doesn't matter which bit of a spectrum you're in, with, you know, it isn't about whether you like it or don't like it, it's about what it stood for behind and what it stands for and what it can stand for. And I think that for us is a very good lesson to take from how we could evolve in, in terms of the design ecology in Hong Kong a and the context. And I think people sort of, what, what, what was very interesting is that you, you look at um, a lot of archigrams, um, drawings and proposals and so on. A, a lot of people kind of thought that, well, you know, it is kind of very, very a contextual, but in fact, um, you know, there are a lot of contexts in it because I know I see uh, particularly a lot, a lot of people who, who sort of, sort of, um, or, or well, not necessarily around in the 60s, but at least around in the UK, you know, they see things like the um, uh, ranging from, you know, the, the swinging 60s, you know, the Carnaby Street scene, blah, blah, blah. and also you see the um, 1951 um, Festival of Britain, you know, uh, the, 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 you know the, the idea of, of how a city could be, you know, for, for, from events, from, from thinking and from exploration of the future to regenerate part of the city. And I think that for us is very interesting in so far as, you know, what does it mean when we talk, talk about the Amplis collection in Hong Kong? What does it mean in the context of Hong Kong? And in a minute, we will, I will also share with you some, some of the ideas that were generated through the um, Biennale. Um, so, one of the things that, that, as I said earlier um, about the Biennale, is about imagination. You know, you know, it couldn't be better a tool to for, for the Archigram collection to inspire people's Im uh, imagination to innovate. And one of the things that we 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 want to put that idea grounded in Hong Kong with the Biennale is we we have a series of talks about, or we planned a series of talks, as you can see, back in February and March, we never really happened. Um, was about you know how Hong Kong as a context is about old and new, old town, new face, about the rural and the urban, you know the city and the and the and, and the and the um, countryside, is about harbor and the coastline, and these in a way if we were to talk about the context of Hong Kong, we, we're not even talking about the the social economic context that was, even that was very e evident in the archigram work, but but if even if we were just talking about the physical, I mean there's a lot of material for. For, for a lot of us to think about and and 
And this actually came through um, in some of the work that I will show you towards the end. And the other idea about um, uh, uh, the Biennale is that this, you know, it's about you know, finding our identity within that context. You know, once you know what that context is, the, the, the next logical step is, is, is to create an identity that, that is not just about now, about the past, but about the future. And in that future, what, what's that kind of, what's the livability? How, how do we live in that future in a kind of sustainable way? So these are the key themes that keep occurring in, in our exploration or, or when we draw uh, inspiration, either directly, indirectly, or inadvertently from the things that we've seen or through, you know, through, through the archigram ideas and so on. So this is one of them for just to, to, to show, um, this is a proposal by um, a, 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 a group um, in Hong Kong, a, a group of designer um, called Architecture Commons. Um, one recurring theme, as I said, was about this, the, the water, about the sea, uh, which is very, very much part of Hong Kong in that context. And what was interesting about this was that um, earlier you saw, you saw um, 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 a quote from this um, uh, entrant, is that they see this, um, what was interesting is that they see um, the idea of future is about just about there and that you can, you can grab it. It's not something that's about 100 years ago uh, in the future. It isn't about something that's completely way out, but almost, they're almost, almost impossible, but bordering between possible and impossible. And they use this idea to think about how we would live in, in the context of Hong Kong, you know, sort of a land issue and so on. And this is one of the many projects started thinking about the near impossible in living in the sea. You know, they, they, they look, look at this as pods that, that instead of kind of walking around in the city, that kind of dive down in the sea to live and use the technology of the, of the tide and of the water to generate kind of power and so on. And, and in a way, you know, I'll, I'll, I often said that, well, we're, you know, if you look at the, the image very carefully, you see a lot of drones flying around. And I always thought that these are kind of, um, something that's left over from those kind of archigram drawings where we've got all these balloons floating around and it just happens that to be kind of uh, 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 drones in this sort of day and age. And this is another one, you know, um, a, a project we, which I think is very interesting in that it really, really, we, we are be, really be, beginning to think about our city, think about, you know, the context of the water, you know, you know, it isn't about the dried land and I, and, and, and it, it immediately releases a lot of possibility for us to look at our city. And again, this is another one which is kind of taking a much more kind of dramatic issue um, about what, what happens if, if, if it is flooded um, in Hong Kong and so on. So, so, so I'm, I'm, we were quite happy in some ways that, that the, the idea of the Biennale to, to, to drive people's imagination, it, it, it really focused on things that is very, very contextual in a way that is very much the idea um, that's beyond the, the visuals of the archigram proposal. It is about, you know, contextual, you know, e, you know even from, from sort of little details. And there are a lot of um, inter interpretation. This is, this is another uh, proposal um, in, in part of the Biennale, which is, which is basically a giant uh, kaleidoscope. But, but at the end of it, it is images of the city, which is composed used, uh, with, in collaboration with an artist about how, you know, how, how we envision in, in different media. And I think one of the things that, that also came through was about how Archigram uses different media films, uh, 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 almost like a, a comic strip um, uh, and zines and collages. And this was also a, another source of inspiration, like uh, the Museum of Tomorrow as an idea about different ways of reinterpret, different ways of telling the story about the cities. It's not just about the, the drawings, the, the, the renderings and so on and so forth. And this is another fun art, uh, idea. And as you can see um, from the conceptual to the to the right of, of the of 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 the um, image imagery of the proposal um, to the actual um, actual object that was made actual installation that was made and the thinking behind was very much grounded by a the water that we live very close to and b how we kind of create these little kind of little environments and and it, it is almost like you know it's like some of the archigram um, sort of proposal which was like human scale a, a, a person scale. And then, and then, and then, how it kind of affects the kind of a larger scale of the city. And um, um, Anthony uh, Anthony Code's um, uh, uh, drawings on the on the right and his proposals. Again, he 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 him himself claimed that that obviously there's a lot of you know ideas that 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 were not less directly generated through his understanding of of analysis of um, um, the uh, uh, 
archigram, but also um, it, at the back, there is certain ideas about how you would present it in different ways. I mean, he created a game about the city as well as drawings, as well as, 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 well as kind of a, a painting. So, so the idea of different ways of presenting was also very interesting. And, and, and finally, I, I, I was, this was kind of um, very interesting because I've always thought if there was one project that really summarized or really kind of uh, showed the physical embodiment of the walking city is this project, which was, you know, Hugh Broughton, a British architect who was built in the Antarctica, which is a building that was built off site and shipped to from, from South Africa, shipped to um, uh, Antarctica and built um, and then walk around, actually literally move in, in the Antarctica and, and the shape and, and is a city in his own on his own being that it sort of people live there in six months on end. But what is what's relevant? I think the interesting thing was that we this was part of the part of the exhibit in the Biennale and and it, it in itself didn't really generate anything, but it generated a conversation because in a you know it, it, practically in a, in a city like Hong Kong it's so dense, it's so uh, uh, land is so, so scarce, you know the idea of uh, modular construction is something very very much in people's mind. And, and through this exhibition, we actually met, you know, there were a, a, a conversation that sparked off between a contractor who, who, who were doing a lot of research into modular housing and modular construction. And it was interesting idea of how this was done. And in a way, it, you know, one, one could imagine that, that the Hong Kong, you know, the, the construction of some of these skyscrapers in Hong Kong could potentially through kind of modular construction, offsite construction could become the idea of a self-building city that grows on its own almost kind of going back to some of the ideas in the 1980s of, of um, arch, you know, not, not even Archigram, but, but you know, the, the, the high-tech architecture that was inspired by that, where they, they almost craned themselves up as they built up. So we were very pleased that actually that conversation through the Biennale was kicked off and, and hopefully we hope something kind of come out of it. Now, you know, we, I've got about uh, 30 seconds left, so it's about right. So, so in a way, I, I just want to uh, requote um, Dennis Crompton's quote. You know, by looking at Archigram's work, you really should think about you not know, as we think, not as we did. So, you know, it's through, I hope through a very, very quick kind of um, show of some of the projects that 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 was part of the Biennale. I was very impressed. I was very encouraged by the fact that that we are thinking, not just doing, and we are thinking and using. You know, the the kind of um, what I call the archigram spirit about you know different ways of presenting you know contextualism and as well. So so thank you very much for your support and 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 as I said, empower the imagination in our future city builders. So that was my quick presentation to to, to kick off the symposium. So thank you very much, Sherry. Thank you, Roger. Uh, again, um, as Roger had said, uh, it's a very different kind of presentation, but we thought it's a. Uh, I guess it's like one way in which somebody could reflect on Archigram's work uh, through their program. And so the next three presentations obviously will be of the historical theoretical types. And we first uh, present Ariel uh, in talking about, yes, um, dismantling architecture. Ariel, please. Uh. Um, I'm Ariel Gennat. I am um, a lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, Weizmann School of Design uh, and an architect. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the uh, Shirley uh, uh, Tao and the organizer of M Plus and HKU for uh, bringing us all together and uh, making us reflect once again on um, the legacy of Archigram and its value for the 21st century. Um, and also I'd like to thank the members of Archigram for putting up with us, uh, for listening and uh, for even commenting on our um, misinterpretation sometimes of their work. Uh, which I think is uh, probably a testimony for the value of the, the work's open-endedness uh, and perhaps also of its ambiguity. Uh, so uh, my, uh, my own interest, our uh, research interests are in uh, the relationships between um, construction technology uh, and architectural expression. Uh, and regularly on uh, Japanese architecture in the 20th and 21st century. Uh, so when I was, uh, you know, I began to think of uh, Archigram's relationships to Asia and particularly to Japan, um, it seems that almost all architecture history books uh, kind of group Archigram uh, with their metabolist peers uh, for obvious visual reasons, uh, but also under kind of the limited banner of techno-utopia. 
Uh, and yet, um, the long lasting relationship of Archigram with Japan was really through the figure of uh, Arate Suzaki, who was not a metabolist, at least that's what he said. Uh, <clears throat> and his work was uh, rather different from uh, that of Archigram. So this sparked kind of a, you know, this was some, somewhat of a mystery for me that I wanted to unravel. Uh, and I realized that um, perhaps the, the key term um, that can unravel this is the idea of dismantling architecture. Um, so I will now uh, kind of leave you with my findings uh, and let you play my uh, recorded uh, video. Thank you. My talk today is called Dismantling Architecture Archigram and Isozaki, circa 1970. What did Arate Isozaki mean when he qualified Archigram's work in 1975 by the term dismantling architecture? Did dismantling mean the same thing for Archigram? And did the irony and cynicism that resonated in their publications equally apply when they proposed to dismantle their own discipline? These questions led me to trace Archigram and Isozaki's exchanges between 1968 and 1975, instrumental to sustaining their respective versions of dismantling. Having, having discovered each other's work circa 1964 in architectural journals, they met for the first time in Milan in 1968. Cook and Isozaki then co-taught a studio in LA and met again in Osaka the following year at Expo 70. Archigram issue nine and a half published in 1974 after its members parted ways was followed by Suzaki's epoch making book Dismantling Architecture of 1975. A year later Cook hosted Isuzaki for a lecture at the AA in London. By that time it became clear that ambivalence was the quality they respected most in each other. Cook presented Isozaki as an architect in ambivalence, quote, who combines his built work with a whole lot of strange, ambiguous, wayward, and curious metaphors. While Isozaki avowed, he once thought Archigram members were technocrats, but was relieved to discover that they were very human. And their work even had a strong humanist side, he said. He praised them for being at once consistently counter-cultural, anti-establishment, and exerting, quote, an enormous destructive power on his work, end quote. By that, one assumes he meant that he had, they had pushed him to question his own path, which subsequently shifted between high-tech, brutalism, abstraction, pop, symbolism, and historicist critique. Archigram and Isozaki's reciprocal recognitions of the value of ambivalence triggered my suspicion that the terms dismantling and dissolution that they often used warrant clarification, which might help reassess their legacy today. My paper therefore unfolds the mutual inspiration that stemmed from their exchanges leading up to 1975. Some discrepancies between Isozaki and Archigram's version of dismantling can be gleaned from their work in the 1960s. Archigram used the latest technology in colorful steel, aluminum, and plastics to achieve qualities of lightness, expendability, and indeterminacy, but within a rational structure. In contrast, Isozaki's buildings used heavy brutalist concrete and boasted cavernous, cavernous interiors inspired by Jomon funerary relics. Isozaki has linked his obsessions with darkness and ruins to wartime destruction that he had experienced as a child. Then again, such was also the experience of the, his metabolist peers and that of Archigram members. Yet neither have ever made the dark aspects of destruction an architectural theme. In contrast, the non-metabolist Isozaki was preoccupied with ruins well into the 1970s, and he criticizes Peer's clear slate approach to reconstruction. 
He expressed architecture's ephemerality through poetic representations of historic fragments in graphic renderings, such as the Shinjuku project of 1963, where classical ruins supporting a megastructure symbolize that while dismantling the past is inevitable, it is never total and ought to structure the future cities. His conviction was likely rooted in his knowledge of Shinto rites of renewal, but also echoed the foundational metabolist book by Noboru Kawazoe of 1960 titled Kenchiku no Metsubo, that is, architecture's downfall, ruination, or extension. Against the impending doom of nuclear war, Kawazoe manifested sober optimism, proposing that architects design with a biological metaphor, accepting their work's decay as an affirmation of perpetual renewal. The metabolist thus merged new technology with pre-industrial Buddhist ideals of impermanence and samsara, encapsulated in Kawazoe's assertion that Quote, order is born from chaos and chaos from order. Destruction is at the same time creation, end quote. The idea that the ground must be cleared of preconceptions, if not of all physical remnants of the past, to allow for a new order to emerge had already appeared in modern and avant-garde manifestos such as Bruno Taut's The Dissolution of Cities of 1920. And it was the limits of the orders proposed by some modern architects and their technological metaphors that led Rainer Bannum, Archigram's best ally, to conclude in 1960 that an architect embracing technology in the second machine age, quote, may have to discard his whole cultural load, including the professional garments by which he is recognized as an architect, end quote. Bannon dismantling was a constructive act, a change in approach and tools. His prophecy reflected and perhaps precipitated the state of affairs in the following decade, when some architects indeed dismantled, sometimes literally, and expanded architecture onto environment, umwelt, ambiente, or kankyo, blurring the lines between architecture, urbanism, and landscape. Banham's text further echoed the atmosphere of the last Siam meeting a year earlier in Otelo, which had brought together Kenzo Tange and his European and American peers. Reflecting on the event on the pages of the Japan Architect of 1970, Tange and Isuzaki discussed two aspects of dissolution. First, the dissolution of Siam in 1959, where Tange, quote, felt a certain discontinuity the spirit of rebellions against Siam, having realized that architects could not understand cities by means of functional analysis alone, end quote. And second, the dissolution of architecture, loosely defined by Isozaki as the expansion of the boundaries of the concept of architecture and of the practices framework. In other words, Isozaki's dismantling was a constructive act in the spirit of Banham's theory and design. These two kinds of dissolution parallel the term's recurrence in Archigram's parlance, as illustrated by a comic strip in the issue four of 1964, Archigram sought, quote, the breakdown of conventional attitudes, or as Cook later put it, quote, an outburst against the well-mannered but gutless architecture that had absorbed the label modern, but had betrayed most of the philosophies of the earliest modern." End quote. Not a total dissolution of the modernism then, but rather a distillation of some modern tenets, critically enhanced with the possibility of dismantling. It was an ambivalent stance, that aimed to maintain ordering devices, but not absolute order or narrative. Functionality, yes, but not naive function functionalism. Archigram's dismantling was an operative term, a technique for invigorating modern ideals through expendability, demountability, disintegration, fragmentation, and absence. 
absent from their discourse was art, symbolism, and theory, which for Isazaki would become increasingly crucial. Meanwhile, in the 1960s, his buildings were monumental fortresses with no possibility to change, which led Ron Heron to un understate that these works, quote, do no more than pursue a path that is the mainstream of modern architecture, end quote. Thus, Isozaki's dismantling remained mostly a theoretical and poetic metaphor, ambiguously fusing opposites, past and present, into conflicted wholes, as Archigarm discovered when they first met in 1968. Attempting to continue the discussion that had begun in Otello, Giancarlo Di Carlo curated the 14th Milan Triennale exhibition around the theme of the greater number, inviting Isozaki and Archigram to participate. It is fitting that they should meet for the first time at a counter event, the cancel inauguration of their exhibition as protesters stormed and occupied the building. The protesters invade against the collaborations of architects with the capitalist system that spawned the paradigm whereby, quote, the city is a machine, the developer uses it, the architect designs it, end quote. They deplored the, the consumerist objectification of the city that happened to be celebrated in the Milanogram installation. Milanogram was a spatial bas-relief assemblage wrapped in a plastic tube suspended from the ceiling. It implied a fragmented environment juxtaposing architecture, fashion, and science and blending past, present, and future. Archigram turned the greater number problem into an opportunity, cheerfully embracing pop and consumer culture, technology, and the market economy towards improving the life of the masses. They did not seek to solve the conflict between the means and the ends, relying instead on the liberal capitalist system and the freedom it afforded individuals. In sharp contrast, in the next room of the Triennale, Isazaki's electric labyrinth displayed morbid images of aging bodies, homeless refugees, and ghosts, which were metaphors for the dire dead-end state of architecture. The metaphor was explicated in the Hiroshima re-ruined collage in the background, which differed from the Milanogram in its flattening of contradictory elements into a static, conflicted whole. It expressed skepticism vis-a-vis -vis metabolists and inadvertently archigrams, faith in technology, hinting that reconstruction for the greater number was not effectively addressed by megastructural schemes. Cook later explained the value of the work's ambivalence, describing it as, quote, a piece of calculated rhetoric presenting fragments of megastructure as both construct and symbol, both architecture and pictorial element, both collapsing and about to go forth. Though his own explanation is that of there being dead architecture, end quote. Ironically, this last expression was what Archigram likely considered Isozaki's concrete buildings to be. But despite the clear contradictions between their versions of dismantling, the Milano encounter spawned a lasting friendship and collaboration in the following year in LA, when Cook invited Isozaki to co-teach an urban design studio. The studio theme paralleled Archigram's own work at the time, Cook and Crompton seem to have been inspired by the Mil Milanese protesters' rejection of the city when they began developing, developing Instant City with Ron Heron as well. And it was in LA that they elaborated the content of their most substantial built work as Archigram, a capsule for the Osaka Expo of 1970. The expo was a spatial temporal node where Archigram's and Isozaki's work was physically and ideologically intertwined for the last time. 
Upon returning to Tokyo from LA in 1969, Suzaki resumed work on the festival plaza under Tange's big roof. He designed the modular mobile theater controlled by giant robots, which Cook particularly admired, describing them, quote, as uh, giant versions of a responsive mechanism, end quote, like the one he had imagined himself. He featured them in Archeogram 9 and in his book, Experimental Architecture of the Same Year. Cook read into this work proof that Isuzaki's, of the Isuzaki's adherence to Archeogram's interest in robotics, flexible structures and environments. And he believes the Isuzaki, quote, had pushed the Fun Palace concept further than anyone, thanks to the degree of flexibility and control that can be offered by the programmers and software end quote. Evidence, Cook hoped, that his friend has stepped forward into the world of real technology, end quote. It would soon become clear that Isazaki's foray into real technology was a glitch in his career. In his retrospective portfolio of 1976, he downplayed the robot's technical merits, extolling instead the formal modularity that linked them to his other buildings, all recalibrated to match his new interest in what he termed architecture degree zero. Back in Festival Plaza, hovering over Isozaki's robots, the Archigram capsule was plugged into Tange's tubular steel space frame. It was initially titled an environmental jukebox and it was designed in LA and London by Cook and Crompton, who had envisaged more sophisticated audiovisual tech than the version eventually executed by Noriaki Kurokawa for Archeogram. While the capsule's yellow metal skin was faceted to match Tange's high-tech structure, it enclosed a dark tunnel whose coarse fibrous plaster walls conferred an archaic atmosphere akin to Isazaki's brutalist spaces, and also to Taro Kamoto's Jomon-inspired Tower of the Sun looming over the plaza. It seems that Archigram and Isazaki's uh, robots were more representative of their alter ego's preference than of their own inclination before and after the event. The capsule's program prompted visitors to reflect on the idea of urban dissolution behind the display's backlit graphics. The bilingual pamphlet Osakagram asked five questions, quote, which implied the disintegration of the city's significance, end quote, at aiming to, quote, suggest that the hallowed role of the city will not remain quite so hallowed. It may soften or dissolve, end quote. Osaka Gram expanded the idea of dismantling from the building scale to the city in a sense that resonated with Tange's observation that with Siam's dissolution came the realization that the city could no longer be planned in functionalist terms alone and that a structural or organic approach had prevailed. The questions were, do you like a highly organized city? Do you need the support of many facilities? Does your life, does your way of life need a city? Would you prefer to be a citizen of the world? Need there be a gap between your dreams and the environment? It is significant that while the first two questions address structure and function, the latter three are concerned with the human psyche and well being, lifestyle social identity, pleasure, and even meaning in, the, in its relationship to the world. The question thus, uh, these questions thus echoed Isozaki's remark that despite the technocratic semblance of Archigram's work, its members were in fact very human and even humanists. In the following years, the human scale and its central aspects seem to have occupied an increasingly central place in Archigram members' work after they had parted ways. 
A year after the publication of the last archigram, nine and a half, in 1974, Isozaki summarized the many facets of dismantling architecture he had gathered over his exchanges with avant-garde figures between 1968 and 1975, publishing them in the book Kenchiku no Kai Tai. The word Kai Tai has been translated as dissoluzione in Italian and demembrement in French. But it seems to me that the term dismantling best describes the theme that Archigram and Isozaki shared since its etymology connotes both shedding the mantellum or cloak of which Banham had spoken and demontle, that is destroying the defensive capability of a fortification. Isozaki shows that those fortifications were equally rooted in construction and in theory. He identifies approaches that support the dismantling of what he calls the apparatus of modern architecture as practiced by Archigram, Hans Holein, Charles Moore, Cedric Price, Archizoom, Superstudio, Christopher Alexander, and Robert Venturi. Under the title Archigram, Reducing Architecture to Information, Isozaki devotes 50 of the, four, of the book's 400 pages to describe and praise their work, but he also criticizes it over its over-reliance on technology. This point is folded into the book's main argument that technology's centrality to architectural research and development since the 1920s has been detrimental to artistic expression and the generation of meaning, or as Isozaki puts it, quote, if architecture is forced to decide between becoming an ally of the technocrat or abandoning design, its philosophy must inevitably lapse into sterility. If this is the case, its operational systems must be destroyed and the concept of architecture itself must be dissolved." End quote. In addition to this dismantling of the centrality of structural technology, the other key element that Isozaki identifies as being dismantled is the architectural narrative. He holds that after 1968, the only persistent architectural theme was, quote, that a major theme no longer exists, end quote. Unlike Archigram members who were never concerned with architectural expression as such, Isozaki's realization of that visceral absence led him on a quest to turn his architecture into what he called a machine for the production of meaning, end quote. Some concluding thoughts. While we have come to take for granted the absence of a narrative in architectural expression in the past 50 years, it seems that the centrality of technology in dismantling architecture and public space has best been demonstrated in the past few months. Since Osaka, the questions posed by Archigram on the city have not only lingered, but some have become reality. On one hand, we have witnessed instant cities erected in 10 days, such as the pop-up hospital in Wuhan. On the other, we have experienced the dissolution of cities, or at least a radical transformation of public space. The term Zoom architecture coined by Archigram in Archigram 4 to refer to space probes, rockets, and moving urban elements has in 2020 gained a new meaning, not as an enhancement of the city's public space, but as its virtual replacement by a disembodied social interaction. The frustratingly limited Zoom architecture I am using right now underscores how radical Archigram's ideas were circa 1970. But it also reveals how unprepared our societies are to dealing with the dissolution of what Archigram called real architecture. Unprepared on the social and emotional level uh, and ill-equipped technologically. In comparison, characters in the sci-fi comics that Archigram recommended seem to handle the dismantling of architecture rather successfully. This begs the question whether Cook's prediction that 
quote, the future of architecture lies in the brain, end quote, is something we still wish for. Furthermore, the 2020 predicament seems to indicate that despite Archigram's call for public participation and implicit individualization of the civic realm, their optimism about the dissolution of cities has avoided addressing the conflict between such countercultural ideals and the ensuing liberty for private capital, corporations, and politicians to dominate the cyberspatial realm. Addressing this point, would have been problematic for their advocacy to embrace technology that at that time was exclusively owned by governments, the military and national space agencies. Perhaps the conflict we experience today could have been anticipated had architects heeded to Archigram's call and taken more seriously the dystopian scenarios of cyberpunk manga of the 1980s. But so as not to remain on a grim note, um, I'd like to propose what I see as Archigram's legacy for the 21st century. It seems to me that Archigram's legacy has been far more substantial than ushering in high-tech architecture as Charles Jenks has maintained. I tend to follow Isozaki who unlike Jenks has identified their contribution to postmodernism, clustering their work with Venturi's. In so doing, he has prompted us to note the affinities between Archigram's indeterminacy and Venturi's advocacy for, quote, both and, black and white, and sometimes gray, end quote. Thus, as I have shown, it was circa 1970 that Archigram and Isozaki have inadvertently set the stage for a postmodern architecture of the kind that does away with dialectics, binary oppositions, meta-narratives, and organic holes in favor of indeterminacy, ambiguity, layered interpretations, fragmentation, and weakness, aspects we now call post-structuralists, and which also qualify our disembodied experience today. It is in this light that we are to understand Isozaki's words of 1972. Archigram's work is being assessed and appreciated anew today because not merely in architecture, but in a far broader sphere, pre-established systems of every kind are disintegrating before our eyes, end quote. In some, Archigram's relevance today is in presenting an optimistic way of living with uncertainty, disorder, and post-truth that have ensued from a dismantling gone amok in many realms of our lives. I hope this reassessment helps harness the dismantling into renewal in times when pandemics and climate change prompt us to rebuild our environment yet again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariel, for this yeah amazing historical kind of a comparative study and very today sort of like relevant today's reflection. So from Japan, we will move towards the uh, Soviet Union with Evangelos. Uh, my name is Evangelos Kotsioris. <clears throat> um, I'm an architectural historian, and I also teach at uh, UPenn School of Architecture as Ariel. So it's great to see his presentation opening before me. Uh, let me try to share my screen also. I wanted to first thank everybody for, for the organization of this treat of a conference of a few days. Uh, today I'm joining you from uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where I also work in the Department of Architecture and Design. And here one of Peter Cook's uh, stray drawings from the Plugin City project um, is located in a thematic gallery that is titled Architecture Systems, uh, which uh, I co-organized with Martino Sterli here about a year ago. And to be precise, uh, Archigram's mischievous spirit is meant to wreak havoc on the positivist concept of systems uh, that dominated post-World War II architectural discourse in this context. And despite having been inspired by standardized structural elements and off-the-shelf industrial technologies, Cook argued, quote, that such a conglomeration does not need to have the dreariness that is normally associated with regularized, social, uh, uh, regularized systems, unquote. So it is precisely this friction between regularization and playfulness that I would like to speak about today. 
my talk that is titled Plugin Communism is looking at the ways in which uh, Archigram's riot of an architecture seeped through the cracks of the Iron Curtain during the Cold War and had a profound influence on a number of largely unknown groups of uh, architects that one could call members of the Soviet counterculture. And in that respect, some of the questions I'm asking here include how architectural ideas transmit across seemingly impenetrable borders. What are the most appropriate media for this transition and circulation? And ultimately, can these ideas withstand the ideological pressure when they're um, applied in a foreign regime? So here we go. Few phrases are capable of inducing more horror than the utterance of the word Soviet housing. Often accused of creating the most monotonous built environment in the history of mankind, and this is a quote, Soviet housing of the post-World War II period has been consistently represented through the imagery of repetitive blocks, like the ones you see here, and historicized as the unfortunate consequence of a rigid design logic that largely relied on the assemblage of prefabricated elements industrially produced at an unprecedented, unprecedented scale. The standardized design of such housing were to were in a large the outcome of uh, state-run design bureaus that were subject to the same hierarchical maladies as the Soviet governance itself. And with every Soviet single, uh, every single Soviet architect being employed by the state, you know, there were no individual practices, any possibility of experimentation was routinely suppressed in its uh, very early nascent stages. Now, despite these limitations, Beginning around 1967-68, and largely thanks to the work of Archigram, a small number of virtually unknown uh, Soviet architects managed to make room for uh, playful inquiry in the name of uh, the communist imperative. Both their official excuse and ultimate purpose was to reimagine the very idea of Soviet dwelling. And in order to do so, such unsung members of the Soviet architectural counterculture had to operate as a kind of Trojan horse within the Byzantine bureaucracy of Soviet design institutions, or as undercover agents who would enrich architectural discourse through ideas imported from abroad, but at the same time would be so cautious as not to provide the grounds for disciplinary action against them. Two of the main protagonists of the story were Iraida Luchkova and Alexander Sikachev, both uh, architects in their early 30s who were employed by the Central Scientific Research and Design Institute for typical and experimental housing in Moscow. So very, very big acronyms. And in their capacity, they constituted two among thousands of other architects assisting a small number of workshop heads, one of which you see here in a kind of film clip, towards the creation, testing and selection of standardized housing designs that would be repeatedly um, uh, deployed almost ad infinitum across the Soviet Union. Now, through their institutional affiliation at the Experimental Institute, Luchko and Sikachev had rare and unrestricted access to foreign architectural publications, which was not something common for everybody in the Soviet Union. And in particular, they were particularly fascinated by the ones originating in the United States, France, and England. And quickly, they were very much captivated by the crashing wave of experimental architecture that had hijacked many mainstream architectural journals, including the AD in London. In between the drudgery of day-to-day -day work at the Institute, Luchko and Sikhaja would study such journals and clip articles and illustrations of visionary projects designed by the likes of Kisho Kurokawa and Kiyonori Kikutake in Japan, William Morgan, Samuel Paul, and Seymour Jarmo in the USA, and Arthur Quarmley in the UK, among others. In either eyes, however, none of these uh, much or less celebrated architects would generate half as much fascination as Archigram and their own approach. It would not be an exaggeration to claim that Luchkov and Sikachev soon became the official and official ambassadors uh, of Archigram's work in the USSR. In December 1968, they authored the very first article to introduce the work of the British group to their Soviet colleagues. Titled The Future of the Living Cell, their piece was not published in a colorful, quirky, or playful equivalent of Archigram itself or AD, but in Housing Construction, a copy of which you see here, the black and white monthly technical magazine of the State Committee for Civil Construction and Architecture that was within their reach. 
Lutko and Sikachev argued that the way to go with Soviet housing would be to adopt this separation between a permanent supporting structure equipped with all the building services and interchangeable residential cells that would plug in. A proposition explored in many of Archegam's projects from the same period, such as the Capsule Homes project of 64 and the Control and Choice Dwelling of 67. With an average of, uh, of, and here you see a kind of close up of um, one of the capsules by Archigram in comparison with other international examples. And with an average of nine to 12 square meters of apartment area allocated to each inhabitant, Soviet apartments of the late 1960s were not only far from spacious, but also quickly outgrown by families who would routinely have to endure a very lengthy process of uh, applying and hopefully being granted permission to relocate to a larger unit when that would become available. So under this light, Lutchkov and Sikachev's proposition that flexible dwellings attributed largely to our archigram's work in the same article were deemed not only radical, but also in sheer violation of uh, party line and state ideology. Here you see, for instance, an example of uh, uh, the Living 1990 project included in the Living Cell article. Now, as a disclaimer preamble penned by the editors of Housing Construction points out, the foreign projects cited in Luchkova and Sikachev's article, quote, are based on a theory widespread in bourgeois sociology that contradicts scientific Marxism and asserts that modern society is only the sum of the individuals, unquote. And the editors concluded that the studies of living cells, such as those uh, of Archigram, were not only carried out abroad, but were also presented here, quote, without deep critical analysis, unquote. So what's fascinating to me is that in this first debut in Soviet architectural press, Archigram was introduced as a threat. And the group's radicalism, perversely, necessitated a kind of uh, spelled out disclaimer. The elasticity of Archigram's dwelling proposals was perceived as destabilizing to the arteriosclerosis of Soviet housing design. And even if the editors of housing construction were clearly trying to cover their own backs, uh, Lutchkova and Sikachev's first technical article planted the seed of intrigue for the potential reimagining of uh, the future of housing under developed socialism of the 70s. In the year that followed in 1969, they were invited to share their reflections precisely on this question in a series of four articles this time, uh, titled Architects Experiment, Architectory Experimentariot in Russian. Um, and this time their heretic propositions would reach as wide as a, you know, a Soviet audience one could get at the time through the pages of the colorful popular science magazine, Science and Life, uh, where you could see you know, the latest capsule version of the Soyuz and so on. So very much in tune with the spirit of the work. The content of this series of articles was excerpted from a much larger research study that uh, Sikachev and Luchkova had undertaken after, as they say, relatively painlessly managing to convince the scientific council and their immediate supervisors, uh, supervisors at their institute for the validity of such an endeavor. Only instead of analyzing the current situation in the USSR as they had initially promised, the research gradually transformed into a kaleidoscopic panorama of the global experiments in architecture of the 60s. Using the expanded platform of uh, science and life, Lutchkov and Sikachev presented the work of Archigram as an, quote, avalanche of projects that bear a semi-fantastical character. And semi is very important here. But these projects, as they are, could, could constitute embryos for rethinking the future of Soviet habitation. Despite originating in the proverbial West, Archigram's work was carefully positioned as a pre-visualization of what the future of Soviet prefabrication industry could be. Peter Cook's Plug-in City, for instance, amusingly translated in Russian as, quote, a city built on the principle of electric plugs and sockets, unquote, so there's a case in point on how um, a piecemeal assembly of Soviet apartments could be reconceived uh, by clustering multiple discrete elements into interchangeable housable housing units, complete with plastic lining and built-in appliances. And importantly, the central planning principle of Soviet housing in the USSR would be particularly conducive to developing a wide, quote, nomenclature of living cells, unquote, 
that would be already fitted with all sorts of combinations of exterior trims, interior color schemes, and electronic appurtenances to match the varying needs of Soviet populations. So, you know, well, long before the contemporary gospel of mass customization, uh, Luchko and Sikachev drew inspiration from Archigram to describe not yet another cookie cutter project, but a seemingly universal principle for highly personalized living attainable only through the strong hand of top-down planning under socialism. Or at least that was the stated agenda. And paying the expected lip service to Soviet ideology as one had to in order to publish, Lutsko Kachev also made sure to point out that one had, would have to critically rethink the interchangeability of cheaply produced uh, apartment units so as not to encourage the mindless cycle of architectural overconsumption. So it's more like architecture on a diet. Inversely, Archigram's work also served as a rear view mirror of, uh, through which Soviet architectural experiments of the 20s could be reevaluated with a fresh pair of eyes. Ron Heron's itinerant walking city that you see here with a Russian uh, caption provided a lens through which Moise Ginsburg's ideas of the mobile shelter could gain new currency, while at the same time be reclaimed as a precedent for the kinetic hallucinations of numerous other Western architects of uh, the global 1960s. And you know, as a reminder, Ginsburg was the author, you know, one of the two authors of the Narkomfin building in, in Moscow and the founder of this organization of contemporary architects. So it's very much about rediscovering one's own history through the lens of Archigram. Archigram's Living 1990 project that you see here in its original installation at the Harris department store and Mike Webb's drive-in house are similarly instrumentalized in the same issue to visualize the idea of a mobile domesticity with their respective hover chair and the vehicle of the two proposals uh, redrawn by hand with all the extended lines on the page to quite literally drive off their home bases on the pages of uh, the journal Science and Life. In yet another cameo, Living 1990 stands as an illustration of a forward-thinking robot-assisted home life that would liberate Soviet architects from the stiffness of typified home designs. Archigram's works, the authors argued, pointed to the new, quote, ways to create apartments, the appearance of which could be largely determined by their tenants. So not fully, but quite largely. For Luchko and Sikachev, the pinnacle towards uh, emancipation of architectural users was none other than the control and choice dwelling project of 1967. Initially featured in one of their articles for Science and Life, the famous wide frame drawing of the project that we've seen many times during these days, uh, soon found its way on the cover of The Future of the Living Cell, a small publication stapled together that summarized their findings at the research at uh, the institute they worked. and was published by the Center of Scientific and Technical Information for Civil Engineering and Architecture in Moscow. So again, you get the most bureaucratic institution published the most kind of um, radical uh, content in many ways. With Warren Schalk's hippie typography, translated in Russian, the slim volume reproduced in 2000 copies was an homage to the captivating power of Archigram's visions, which would be finally made both accessible and intelligible uh, to the unsuspected generations of Soviet designers. So here I'm also you know, very much fascinated how all the different kind of layers of text and uh, drawings that we know that compose all this uh, imagery is actually disassembled and translated uh, and transliterated into Russian to compose a new kind of version of it. Most consequentially, the intellectual ferment of this research and publication gave birth to Lutskova and Sikachev's own speculative proposal in 1971. Titled Dwelling 2071, their ambitious project was an obvious world play on Archigram's Living 1990. And the drawings and narrative of the proposal itself synthesized of uh, all of their fascinations with the group. In other words, the brave new world of megastructures, prefabricated living cells, domestic robotics, and what they called the quote, disappearing interior, unquote, of non-furniture environments. And air all this in one place, in one project. Arranged at top of a three-dimensional structure made of pyramidal space frames, a vast variety of mobile, inflatable, and infinitely transformable dwellings encapsulated their ultimate vision of what Soviet housing should aspire to be. An architecture of multiplicity freed from the straitjacket of Cartesian orthogonality. 
But if researching and publishing on the quote, frivolity of Western architectural discourse, unquote, was tolerated by the leadership of uh, Tsuniep, uh, presenting such an example of architectural fiction as the future for the future of Soviet housing 100 years down the road was one step too far for them. Dwelling 2007 presented as a series of well, one by one meter boards that you see here, uh, raised one too many eyebrows by fellow architects when it was revealed through a film streak like presentation at the Institute in 1971. The project was dismissed as a futile waste of the Institute's resources, a parasitic endeavor bearing no immediate utility. And even if uh, Luchkova and Sikachev's blatant deviation from Tsniep started state admission to cater for the country's immediate housing needs, uh, briefly escaped the scrutiny of Soviet bureaucracy, it was soon made clear for them that uh, this prolonged tangent into the realm of the unrealizable must come to a screeching halt. With the undercover radicalism of uh, Luchkova and Sikachev out of the picture, one would expect that the lineage of Soviet architectural counterculture that I just explored would also suffer an early death. Nevertheless, their provocative articles, including a last minute publication of Dwelling 2071, renamed as 72 to match the issue number, uh, as a last hurrah almost of, uh, of the team, had already managed to corrupt a new generation of Soviet architects with an itch for creative experimentation. Archigram's cellular structures had already found their ways in the radical housing proposals of other groups, such as in the kinetic system of settlement designed by a group led by architect Andrei Ikonikov, uh, uh, an image on the cover of a book and a model that you see here of. And beginning in 1972, another one of these groups that was headed by Alexander Yabushin, an architect employed at the Institute of Technical Aesthetics in Moscow, that you see here designing tractors and industrial engineering work. Together with graphic designer Evgeny Bogdanov and designer Vladimir Paperny, Diabushin developed a series of speculative projects for reconfigurable domestic environments that promised to do away with traditional domestic space and functioning furniture. As it soon became obvious, the ghost of Archigram's work was not only still present, but had in fact found a new host institution to cause trouble in. In March 72, Ryabushin published the first article in their journal Architecture USSR to feature the work of Archigram. And the projects that you can see here uh, included the Living Pod, Manzak Tomato, the Control and Choice Dwelling, and many others. And considering Archigram's you know, hugely influential trajectory outside Britain that we've seen throughout the conference, this would be rather inconsequential. However, within the highly regulated context of Soviet publications, the prominent um, uh, featuring of Western architectural collective in the profession's most circulated journal was not simply a simple feat. As an official organ of the USSR Union of Architects, Architecture USSR was the most guarded bastion of the profession, uh, reserved to showcase only domestically produced work. And even in the 1990s, the fact that Ryabushin managed to convince Konstantin Trapeznikov um, the journal's long-standing and ideology-abiding editor-in-chief to prominently showcase, let alone celebrate, uh, the work of a Western architectural practice was a risky operation, one that could have easily cost the livelihoods of both. Largely inspired by Archigram's interior projects, Ryabushin's team developed the Dwelling Theater, a concept for a transformable domestic interior made possible by a system of mobile elements that would render traditional modes of material possessions and placeness obsolete. Influenced by the early development of environmental studies and global uh, movements that investigated the idea of nomadism, the dwelling theater was conceived as a, quote, flexible environment capable of reacting with sensibility to changes in everyday situations, unquote. And the component at the heart of the project was the domestic communication center an information terminal that would be able to receive data and images from a centrally located infotech. Delivering information to each house across the country, the DCC was imagined to produce a new type of collective subjects relegating participation in advanced socialism to the sphere of the newly formed immaterial community or what we would call a forum today. 
Rebushin's group designs and their publications in Soviet journals are, are watched with references to some of architects' core concepts. And for instance, the idea of uh, the domestic communication hardware plugged into a larger urban infrastructure largely echoes Dennis Crompton's Computer City of 1964. Um, and many other principles can be traced to many of the other works. Most obviously, perhaps, Ryabushin's group also employed the visual language and representational techniques of Archigram, which involved the playful use of ink and felt tip market drawings and collages, intermixed with quirky, quirky typewritten commentary in Russian. Um, and in that respect, their work is also visually indebted uh, in, to Ron Heron's pop typography, exemplified in projects such as the laser study that we also saw earlier today. Like many Western avant-garde groups of the 60s and 70s, Ryabushin's group relied on mobilized publications and exhibitions for their dissemination, uh, for the dissemination of their ideas. Yet, contrary to their Western colleagues, they relied on the official channels of communications, such as the journals that I just um, outlined earlier. And while these groups drew heavily from the theories of Western architects and theorists, and they would be frequently quoting Marshall McLuhan, or um, you know, many other kind of Western thinkers, their carefully crafted verbal commentaries made sure to cite the works of socialist intellectuals, including Karl Kantor and Boris Kushner. And as employees of the Soviet state, uh, their funding was dependent on these larger structures and institutions that they sought to erode from within. In that respect, the group's public admiration and reference to the work of Archigram was itself a form of countercultural practice, I would argue a balancing act between tactful disguise of critique and a call to arms, or a precarious endeavor that plugging, plugged into existing state institutions and ideological discourse to undermine the material realities and societal structures that perpetuated on the ground. As one of you would expect to conclude, the flow of ideas and images were not merely one-sided. Peter Cook explicitly acknowledged the fact that he drew inspiration from and republished the work of Soviet architects in his books. This included both the speculative designs of the Soviet rationalists and constructivists in the 20s, as well as more contemporary groups. In his 1970 book, Experimental Architecture, for instance, which I have here by my table, um, he prominently featured the work of the Soviet collective New Element of Settlement, or the NER group. And in particular, their 1967 project for Moscow is indicative of the radical reawakening taking place in Russian architectural scene. Uh, and most likely, Cook first encountered Wertner's work during the 14th Triennale di Milano, which came up also in Ariel's presentation in 68, where the NER group exhibited their proposal upon invitation of Giancarlo De Carlo. In his accompanying text and critical commentary of the project, Cook points out that Nurse imaginative proposals, quote, incorporate several concepts of growth, change, and choice hitherto assumed to be Western, unquote. And so to conclude, I would like to argue that instead of an impermeable bar barrier, uh, as it is often conceived, the Iron Curtain of the 1960s and early 70s should be rethought as this kind of semi-permeable membrane or a cellular membrane one that allowed the limited, if highly impactful, circulation of visionary architectural ideas to seep through. And in this context, the slippages of Archigram's work, or what we would call glitches within the system through the cracks of the membrane, had a profound and lasting influence on the undercover representatives of the Soviet architecture, architectural counterculture, who sought to imagine alternative modes of for domestic life under socialism while still being employed by the state. Thank you very much. So Evangelos, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful insight to like a completely how the desires of Archigram's kind of like uh, state of living is transposed in this completely different political system. And so very unlikely kind of a transmission, but it's great to hear that. So the next one, and finally, last but not least, will be uh, Mark Wigley. Uh, welcome you to close this session for us, I guess, in that sense. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of fun to be with you. And I think it's a great moment, you know, when, when the... Uh... Archigram archive uh, goes to, to M plus. Uh, it's a fantastic moment and it's a great reversal, right? Because normally everything goes from the colonies to a, a museum in London. So now it actually to a big museum in London, like a fortress. And now it goes the other way to an even bigger museum in Hong Kong. So I think the whole thing is very uh, amazing and uh, fantastic. And I think it's a little bit like a dream come true. But you know, every dream uh, that comes true is a bit of a nightmare too. It must be very complicated for Archigram, 
because on the one hand, it's a great honor to be have the archive there, and, and it's also very difficult. Maybe it's like uh, your child goes to university, you feel very proud, but actually the child is no longer yours. Uh, and might start to behave in different ways, have relationships in different ways, sexualities in different ways, like everything is a, a, a big risk. And, and so I think emotionally probably quite, quite uh, complicated for the, for the uh, Archigram gang. And because they are British, they're not allowed to uh, be emotional. So, so we, we will never know. Um, me too, by the way. Uh, but it's not just complicated for the group. It's kind of complicated for the concept. Like, what does it mean for Archigram to be uh, kind of uh, like in, in a museum, uh, like really deep, deeply in a museum, even if that museum is, is super uh, innovative like M plus and is really trying to overcome the normal uh, dominance of the North and the West in favor of the South and the East, which is I think why uh, M plus is a very, very important uh, uh, project. You could say, of course, that one of the purposes of M plus would be to make uh, the British uncomfortable. Uh, this, I think, is reason enough for, for M plus. Uh, but it would also mean to make architecture uncomfortable, because if, if the North and the West have been the sort of dominant forces in thinking about architecture, moving the archive to the East and the South means somehow moving away from architecture's own uh, identity. And actually, in, in that spirit, I love very much the, the presentations of Ariane evangelist because I think this issue there is, is, is there. But let me try to show you some, some uh, uh, pictures. Okay, so our theme is, is transmission and I will say, let's say retransmitting uh, Archigram. I mean, the first thing to understand about uh, Archigram, I think is, is uh, not one thing. The name Archigram implies one thing, but he, you see here kind of this sort of six uh, characters, each somehow identified with a signature, with a name, a face, and, and uh, uh, a project. What's pretty amazing about Archigram is that they pretend to like each other when surely they do, do not. Uh, and this is why the group is uh, strong, uh, because they have a lot of uh, internal competition, a lot of envy, jealousy, competitiveness. This becomes a kind of architectural competitiveness, so each project tries to be more interesting than everybody else's. And then it gains momentum because uh, all this difference, all this conflict, all this competition is somehow uh, pushed together, mixed together. You see it already very clear in uh, Archigram 1. The kind of different projects by the different members and also people who are not the members become some kind of city. You see it already. Archigram, city is, uh, Archigram is Archigram City, and this is a city full of uh, ideas that are somehow in tension with each other. It's also theory. You notice that we get to it through words, very careful words which are also somehow everywhere in the, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the issue. So there is in Archigram a kind of urbanism of tension, uh, 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 of, of kind of agitation, and, and it's kind of uh, bubbling away. So Archigram is always uh, not sitting still. It's very restless. It's very uh, uh, annoying, like some kind of conversation where someone else says something new, and then you have to kind of respond with something even better and so on. And you have to show you're the same and you're different and you get this kind of uh, vibrancy. So Archigram is, let's say, the, the, the name of a kind of uh, 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 psychological competition that is not allowed to call itself psychological. It's so it calls itself architectural. So architecture becomes psychological. We start to get a city that, has, uh, 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 is, that is somehow agitated, uh, uh, un unstable. So there's a kind of destabilizing of architecture that comes out of the idea of just holding a group together, a group that's not really, let's say, a group, but more, I think, as, as David Green said once, more, more collective. So things that have been collected together, that there's some solidarity, but also a lot of uh, uh, difference. Uh, Archigram is the name of academics. I mean, super important. Uh, they are academics, they are teachers, they work in schools, they write, they make exhibitions, make speculative projects, but they are thoroughly uh, 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 academic. Archigram, Archigram is the name of uh, an, an academic project. This project might call itself anti-academic, but this is very typical of uh, uh, academics. Actually, by the way, only academics talk about anti-academic. No one else cares, right? If the academy of academic means I'm not interested, boring. Uh, actually, people who are interesting are not interested in this boring thing. The only people who say I'm not academic, I'm anti-academic, are academics. In this sense, totally, totally, uh, Archigram is in that role. 
uh, right now they're playing the role of uh, four grumpy old men. Um, uh, and I would say playing, the wo playing it really well, like uh, grumpy and, and old. Uh, by the way, they used to play the role of uh, young grumpy men. So the grumpiness is just continuing. And in fact, it used to be six grumpy men. Uh, but somehow the four grumpy men have managed to communicate the full authority and power, the kind of agitation I was talking about before of, of, of the youth. And this grumpiness, this grumpiness, which often takes the form of anti-theory, of saying that they're not into theory, is all part of the performance, has been at the beginning. Right? Uh, so, so their discomfort with this conference, this discomfort with uh, the possibility of theory and history, this discomfort is part of the Archigram project, was there from the beginning, and is, is of course, a theoretical uh, uh, position. You see it here in, in, the, in the cover. It's all theory. These are very, very carefully uh, uh, selected words. Again, anti-theory, that's typical of theorists, right? Typical of uh, academics. Who else cares whether it's theory or not? Who have even wonders what is theory? Uh, are, are only theorists. Uh, actually, I would go more than that. It's not just that Archigram were uh, theorists, despite their uh, problems with theory or their stated problems with theory. Actually, I think intellectuals. Uh, and certainly, if you look, for example, at the projects of uh, of David Green and, and uh, 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 Michael Webb. This is intellectual work. This is the, th this is the, the thinking of, of intellectuals over very, very long uh, uh, timeframes. So my, my main point here would be that they are super grumpy right now because they, uh, they're very reluctant to let go of the intellectual narrative. The moment of the archive going to, to M plus is the, maybe the beginning of the narrative being in, in other hands. Uh, and therefore the theory being interfered with in a way. Uh, it's a kind of a risk to uh, the, the, the theory of the uh, uh, project. Uh, by the way, um, if you look into the world of Archigram, into the city of Archigram, you will not see any old men there, right? If you look inside this, the future city of Archigram, everybody is young. Yes, there are children. Their children even represent youth. I think maybe the oldest person you find in an archigram image anywhere, maybe is somebody fishing, not quite retired in the, in the David Green project, one of the early uh, projects. But generally in the world of archigram, there, are, there is no space uh, for, for grumpy old men. Uh, there's no space for me either, by the way. I'm finished, not there. Maybe, maybe why archigram doesn't want to let go of archigram is because archigram is the promise of eternal youth like beautiful weather. Uh, I mean, maybe the whole project, maybe Archigram was a kind of weather machine to somehow produce in London a sense of kind of Californian weather and a kind of lightness and happiness. And lightness and happiness uh, produced in London still uh, shocked, traumatized uh, uh, by the Second World War and somehow turning to, to a, a kind of possibility of some kind of happy uh, future. If you look into, into Archigram, look into the city, if you occupy the city, the people that you will meet there, they have been taken from the pages of advertisements. They are young, happy uh, 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 consumers. Um, what I want to say very quickly in, 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 this, uh, in, this, in this meeting is that I think fundamentally Archigram is a, is a channel, is, is a program, is, 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 a, is a television program. It's a highly scripted program. It has a certain uh, tone, a certain rhythm, a certain visuality. Uh, um, and there's an enormous expertise in this uh, uh, television program, even if Archigram would themselves never have imagined that what they were doing was TV. And this is a little bit what I want to suggest to you, that, that there is a uh, television sensibility everywhere in, 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 in Archigram. I mean, it's not just in the TVs that hang around. If you look at the sort of inspirational images for Archigram, you'll all see TVs many, many TVs. It's not just this, but surely it includes this. And nor is it it's simply in the TV sets that you find at the center of the uh, production of, of a kind of archigram experiences here, Dennis Crompton, here, uh, Peter Cook, always there's some kind of a TV set hanging around. Nor is it, it, nor is it in the actual TV programs, like, you know, with the BBC or on TV. Or even, let's say, with David Green in the kind of, uh, here, the Aboriginal TV, the kind of confrontation of the human or proto-human 
uh, and the technology, right? It's not, not even there. It's not even, uh, let's say, the kind of uh, uh, image of a TV or, 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 or a TV set. I think it's more in the kind of ghosts that are always haunting uh, uh, the work of, of uh, Archigram, uh, Bucky Fuller, Cedric Price, and Conrad Vaxman, all of whom were obsessed with television. Totally, totally, totally. In any conversation with them, very quickly, uh, TV. Buckminster Fuller, 1927, one year after the first TV set is, is demonstrated, is already arguing that the television will be, interactive TV will be the center of, uh, of architecture. Architecture can become so light and so delicate, as you see here in the project exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, it can become just a window, a 360 degree window, so light, so ephemeral, precisely because there is TV at the center prov providing these kind of communication through the antenna on top of the 4D tower. Cedric Price, television, television, television. Cedric Price, the architect of the dotted line, right? The absolute expert, how to make architecture, which means to make anti-architecture of, of dotted lines. Look at the Fun Palace. It is a dotted line in, in every sense. What is structural, what is most solid are the dots. What is happening is between the dots. The dots mean anything can happen. Cedric's favorite drawing of the whole project, the dimension of the dots. It's a kind of three-dimensional dotted line in which the future could unfold. The dotted line dematerializes walls, roofs, building, structure, solidity, dematerializes architecture so that things can happen, so that architecture can have a future. Architecture only makes a future if it would de dematerialize itself, right? Uh, not by chance, the early drawing of the Fun Palace has an enormous television antenna to bring this kind of uh, interactivity uh, uh, into, into play. Conrad Vaxman, exactly the same. Vaxman is the, the great expert of the joint, how to put something uh, together. So people tend to think, oh yeah, he's holding architecture together. Oh, it's great, it's tectonics, it's the way things are put together. But this enormous uh, uh, space frame the whole point of Vaxman's argument is that if you can make the joint ever more perfect, you can make an architecture which is only joint. And if it's only joint, then life in this world, life in the space frame is whatever you make it and you will make it electronically and if it, there will be, as he calls it, flickering screens. So this kind of web uh, of Vaxman is actually a web that will give way uh, to te television. And he's very clear about that. Basically what I'm trying to say is, is that for Bucky Fuller and for Cedric Price and for Vaxman, uh, architecture can dematerialize itself in the name of whatever future you would like to have and to be, whatever human you would like to be or post-human you would like to be. And television is actually in a way what is, is the kind of joint that holds together a kind of architecture without architecture, a kind of uh, future. And in fact, Vaxman always pointed out that at the center of a joint, and this is the joint of that space frame that I showed you before, there's always a hole, right? There's always an emptiness. So in, in fact, architecture wraps itself around an emptiness, even a dotted line, there it is at the middle of the middle of the thing is a, is a kind of a hole. So these three figures, uh, Fuller, Price and, and Vaxman, I think are enormously important kind of uh, gurus or ghosts of the Archigram uh, uh, project. And I just want to show you that something similar is going on in their work. That is to say, uh, they are literally trying to uh, uh, dematerialize architecture in the way that Fuller talks about. They try to produce an architecture of the dotted line, like, uh, uh, like Cedric talked about. And like Faxman, there is a kind of dream, dream here that the, that the way things are put together, the way they fit together, the more precise it is, the more careful you are, the more clear you are, the more realistic you are, about how to put something together, the more surreal and the more open the consequences. So again, uh, you can look into a project and you could find, let's say a TV set, you see it there plugged in there, you see the TV screen. But of course you could reverse it. You could say all of this uh, uh, equipment that makes this uh, capsule apartment has been built around the TV set and even has the shape of the TV set. After all, if you look at all these panels, why they take this, why they take this uh, 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 form? or you look into this project, you, you will often meet a kind of proto TV or a quasi TV, which takes the form of a kind of media tower, in this case, here it is sitting in the middle of the space and a screen 
Again, a screen that takes the form of a TV screen, but it's not a TV screen. It's a kind of idea of, 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 of television. It's the production. It's a kind of a piece of equipment that lives with you in the house and allows you, not doesn't simply live with you in the house, but in a certain way projects and produces the house that you are living in. This is, this, these are media towers are not simply as it were uh, producing a new kind of decoration on the walls of an apartment. They are actually projecting the possibility uh, uh, of that apartment, right? So you can see something marked as media, marked as tower. In fact, it's kind of the engine of the entire uh, experience in the same way that you find in the, in the three gurus. You see it in the 1990, the two robots, one of which is, as you see written here, a 3D TV. And a 3D TV is not a TV, but it's a kind of projection system, a screen system that goes beyond what television already operates. And you see the basic principle of that media tower is the principle of the entire apartment. And of course, the principle of the entire apartment is that nothing is ever in one uh, place. Uh, in fact, in early versions, I noticed that it's the media tower that used to move. And then in the last version, it's the parent tower uh, that doesn't move. So finally, in a certain way, media goes from being in just in this one project goes from being off to one side as the sort of agitated uh, teen teenager to becoming the parent who's actually organizing the entire system. So again, I would suggest to you, it's the media tower at the center of this apartment that allows the apartment to be an apartment. And what it means to be an apartment is to never be the same thing uh, uh, for even a minute. And just to remind you of the kind of technical drawings of exactly that tower, since the tower is built for the model, always with Archigram, a gesture towards the possible nothingness, the possible dematerialization, turning architecture into some kind of cloud and a very precise technical drawing. Again, uh, the amazing uh, David Green project, uh, the television set in the corner of the space, the kind of Paisley 60s heterosexual happy space uh, is uh, actually mobilized uh, by the television set. By the way, maybe not simply heterosexual since it's a kind of more of a menage a trois, two people in a TV set. The TV set actually responsible for creating the kind of possibility of uh, environment. Maybe it's a more prosthetic experience like in the infogongs, right? Or it's a kind of uh, wrapping, uh, a kind of intimacy, a kind of uh, uh, looking at television as looking at yourself. And looking at television is living. To be looking at television is to be in a kind of a spaceship, a spaceship through which you travel, travel through the whole world, whether it be in the bathematic or the Sutaloon television, television, television. So let's say Mansart, right? I look at a TV, but this looking at the TV produces architecture. You see it perfectly in the heron drawing on the right. And architecture here is not architecture uh, as before. I, it, here, architecture is a kind of a media space, a space of the, not just simply the technology of the media, but of the, of the kind of uh, uh, environment. It's a kind of a sensuous environment. It's a kind of a, a, a world of images that has shape, right? Has uh, uh, lines, all the lines that used to be the lines marking your buildings. But by the way, look closely at this uh, architecture. It's all dotted lines, right? The more closely you look, you see that this is an architecture uh, of the dotted line an architecture of TV. TV would be the word for what happens to architecture when it becomes a dotted line, when it becomes open to uh, unusual, unexpected futures. Let's look again at, at, con at control and, and choice. At first, it's an, it's an object, right? You, you see the technology, it's carefully thought through. It, it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, from a technical point of view, you zoom in. Okay, it makes sense, but starts to become, even in its precision, uh, strange, interesting, no? You zoom in closely. Again, you can find the TV as a kind of piece of technology, but it's co co connected to a kind of set of instruments like a set of uh, surgical instruments or a kind of a dentistry thing. And this set of instruments is going to transform the rest of the space. It looks here like we have architecture, we have columns, we have floors, maybe they move, maybe they can change, but still it's something like architecture. But there is a kind of a timeline from 68, the project more from 67, but 68 through to 1985. Uh, there's another version of the timeline, a little bit longer, going all the way to 1990. Notice what happens in the timeline. We start off with a grid and walls, recognizable walls. Maybe they are not the walls of a traditional house, but they are kind of lighter. Robots are becoming active. They become more active. The more active they are, the less walls you get, and the more movement of the robots. 
until finally all the walls and all the grid is gone and replaced with a kind of ephemeral sphere. And if you look in closely, you find a television, you find environment can be simulated, seen but not really there, experienced. So a kind of fully holographic television set. So the timeline of this project, the very technical precision of this project leads us to a kind of cloud, a kind of a wispy cloud, which makes me think, of course, of the story of a thing, the amazing uh, David Green Michael Webb project of, of 63, a project of almost nothing, a project of a kind of dotted architecture that would be at the size of the, uh, 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 of the kind of a planet. And listen to the words, because again, always the words, because these are theorists, these are intellectuals, they say. Anyway, with communication, with closed circuit TV, we may not want to live in cities at all. The thing gradually materializes, covering the earth in its net. So a kind of uh, uh, image, a kind of cloud appears, just like the cloud of Conrad Waxman, there but not there, the biggest building in the history of humanity, and yet not there, almost not there, in the name of a kind of a future. So this is the kind of uh, endless project. Uh, the endless project of Archigram is to be doing stuff, but stuff that will give way to a world be, be beyond, beyond stuff. And you see it in every instrument. So you use the soft sheen, the, the, the soft screen, uh, soft scene uh, projection system. Okay, yes, it's using kind of slide projectors or movie projectors and so on, but actually the, what it's trying to produce is a new kind of a TV set. You see it so, so clear, which will radiate out, uh, uh, can be a, again, an enormous version of the little, the little tower that was inside the apartment projecting out uh, or, pro or projecting inwards within environmental jukebox. Again, architecture becomes a kind of dotted line and the real architecture is the kind of sensory space of images at, at the middle of it, which produce some kind of uh, environment which is a fully enclosing, fully sensual, but has no physical substance, is kind of whatever happens to architecture when architecture uh, is gone. Beyond architecture, right? So it's, it's precisely not only an intellectual project, but a kind of anti-architectural project, or at least a beyond architecture project. So it's a question, what happens next? Like, you know, it's a positioning of a question. Well, hey, hey, what happens next? Uh, so you broadcast a program, a TV program, about the possibility of an architecture transformed by TV, and you don't know what will happen next. So it's the presentation of a question. So for example, beyond architecture is again, another kind of a media sensory environment of overlapping images in which some kind of possible future is elaborated. You can do the drawing of it, you can do the architecture of it, but it is an architecture of projection of screens and so on. And a, a drawing that has no sensuality in order to produce this kind of uh, sensuous space. It can be quite literally television in that sense of the BBC. Again, that drawing can be uh, exactly the drawing of a kind of a studio. What if, what if uh, 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 Archigram's endless project was to sort of portray life, human life, as kind of life in a, in a, in a TV studio, as a kind of a broadcast uh, uh, experience, right? Um, and again, if you look at the, at the uh, projects, particularly, uh, Peter Cook and Dennis Compton working with the light sound workshops in Hornsey. Again, you get these very abstract technical drawings of the space of communication, let's say, but a space understood to be full of TV sets operating as monitors that produces a certain kind of sensuality as you see here from some of the light sound uh, 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 production. And of course, the people who are working on this, on this light sound production, this one in particular, will become uh, partners of of uh, uh, of Aki Graham and work on some of those projects. Even the lawn uh, project I showed you before, produced by the same person that produces this image. So what I'm trying to say is there is a kind of uh, 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 sensibility, a sensation of television, which is everywhere in Aki Graham, and they are kind of television performers in a kind of performance, a TV performance about TV, and the story, the narrative, the big narrative is beyond architecture, whatever happens next. So you can get these very, very uh, spare drawings, I think here by Dennis, showing a kind of media environment or the system that will produce a media environment. And that media environment will have something of the sensuality of this image of Ron Heron. If we look into this image, 
I can see TV sets, they are there, there's somebody watching TV. I can see somebody wearing TV. Uh, I see a kind of space produced by TV. I see TV out, in, out, in. What I don't see is architecture as normally uh, 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 conceived. So what I'm trying to say is that archigram is not simply uh, into media, like making a kind of a media space uh, in the sense of the happenings or the multi-central uh, environments or the nightclubs and, and all of that, but really they're kind of visualizing a television. Uh, uh, not the TV set that you just simply look at, but the, the new kind of human produced by uh, uh, the TV environment. Uh, Rainer Banham, not by accident, uh, describes television as the symbolic machine uh, of the second machine age. Television is, uh, uh, for the world of electronics, what the turbine was for, for the first machine age. Uh, it is like uh, 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 the key thing. Or to say it another way around, if you're an architect and you don't have any ideas about television, then you're an idiot, right? And, and, and you know, in, in architecture, we do have a, a reasonable um, stockpile of stupidity. And a lot of it has to do with not talking about television. Architects hate television because Television seems to be so disrespectful of architecture. It just seems to sort of go on through. Uh, it seems to be tacky. It seems to be popular culture, but even worse, it does all the things that architects thought that they were going to do. Community, communication, memory, education, everything uh, that architecture thought it would offer. Television is a great threat to architecture. Television uh, threatens architecture. Television is maybe the end of architecture. But you must notice, of course, that television itself has now gone, right? T television itself has become history. We have moved into a kind of post-television world. So here we have Archigram producing, in my opinion, this astonishing ongoing performance, which is a performance about television, uh, a world of TV, a world made possible by TV, but a world in which TV no longer appears. In other words, we no longer live in TV. You might say, well, no, we have uh, presidents uh, until recently that are reality TV stars with all of the pornographic violence that that involves. Or it could be that you feel like we're all living a kind of television age in which everybody on their cell phone is producing their own uh, profile and, and so on. We are either living inside television now or television is gone. I don't know which one it is. Nobody will know, but architects need to, as it were, engage in this. And I think the movement of the Archigram archive into M plus raises that question. What does it mean to archive a television project uh, uh, into a kind of uh, uh, museum? Maybe I return to you just to sort of finish this off, finish myself off. Um, television, I'm trying to argue to is for a certain group of architects, simply the word for the future. Television is not what the TV set is, is at the moment or what the program is. Television is the possibility of a future. It's a kind of a word for the future. I include Archigram in a group of what might be called anti-architects that for whom there is this possibility of dissolving architecture through, uh, through TV understood as a sort of a sensuous environment, interactive environment of of information. Uh, Archigram is a TV program uh, with its uh, personalities. Uh, it's a soap opera. Uh, the Archigram opera, it's a soap opera. That's why we like it. That's why we're interested. It's a soap opera with lots of spin-offs, uh, lots of uh, reruns, um, theorizing and visualizing live inside overlapping discordant streams of information. So it's really about this older idea of TV, this thought that of television as, as liberation versus maybe today's world in which TV uh, uh, imagery, everything is something more kind of uh, generated. Today, we are perhaps more like swimming in information. Uh, and, and, and also notice that, that in the archigram world, you could say there is also a kind of um, editing of information. There's only happiness. There's only youth. There's only good weather. So archigram is also a kind of anesthetic. It's a kind of a way of thinking, a way, how could one occupy this world of TV uh, and feel not just okay, but good, great, happy even. Um, happiness is uh, not a popular um, um, uh, 
product in, in England or, or in New Zealand where I'm from. So for a group to produce, for an unhappy, grumpy group to produce images of a happy life, uh, it's, it's tricky, it's, it's interesting. This happiness is somehow strange, somehow uncomfortable. This happiness might be even a kind of way of dealing with the fact that we live in a pretty shitty world in which lots of stuff is going wrong. So there may be this kind of production of a kind of a space uh, of escape. So this, the, the future might be something like uh, uh, escape. This world of great weather, of great sex, of, of eternal youth, this world of the uh, future, which is the future of the past, the future of the 60s, you could say, this is the, this is the image that goes now into Archigram. Um, it'll be used there to make a variety of new programs, right? It's very clear that material will produce a lot of new programs, not just one program, but many and many different types of programs, uh, none of which will be in control anymore of the Archigram group itself. And this is their anxiety. This is their uh, fear. But I would say it's also precisely the future. I think M plus the plus would be the future. Uh, what I would say Archigram finally gets a future. It never had a future before because with Archigram always the future is Archigram. The future is what Archigram was, which is why they spend a lot of time as referees saying, no, no, that's not what we meant or this is what we did mean and so on. So in other words, they are very, have been very, very reluctant for Archigram to have a future. They wanted, and I totally understand, or I think I totally understand, Archigram to be the present precisely, to be alive, right? So this idea of Archigram having a future, I think it's the idea of having, of having new lives. And precisely what M plus means is we don't know what's going to happen. That's the brilliant thing about the plus. We have no idea uh, what, what's gonna happen when the grumpy referees, the theorists, the academics, no longer get to deal with it. Archigram's story would be, oh, now we hand over to the academics. Academics are boring. Our project is going to be killed by a group of people and we're not even going to get to see it happen or to control it. I think it's the exact opposite. Archigram was an academic project, has been an academic project, has been totally controlled by a series of very sophisticated academics that keep telling you they're not sophisticated and they're not academics. Don't believe it for a second. Otherwise, why are you listening to them? Right? Why are you still listening? Right? Because they know what they're doing. Right? The academics now give the project to M plus. M plus's responsibility is to ensure that the future is not academic, is, is a kind of uh, uh, flourishing, as, as a future is multiple, that more points of view will be added to the mix. This urbanism of the Archigram city, this mixture, this discord, uh, this vibrancy uh, that was produced, this image can only be realized, I think, in, 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 in this way. Maybe the Archigram TV show itself, the whole project of Archigram, should now be thought of as a kind of a scaffolding, like the scaffolding you see in their projects. The, the scaffolding is the last trace of architecture, what's left, a little bit of structure to hold a few ephemeral things in place. Maybe the Archigram archive itself is a kind of a scaffolding, is a kind of uh, a, a mirage of, of architecture in which something else will happen, in which architecture will pulsate, will mutate, and will perhaps uh, disappear. I think Archigram uh, worked to try to make a kind of dotted line that created the possibility as a kind of a threshold to whatever comes next, whatever comes after architecture. I think if the project is successful, and I really would love that, uh, I think if this project is really successful, it will be because future generations come up with stuff and it'll be stuff that neither the group uh, or us uh, uh, will endorse, will agree with, but more importantly, we probably won't even be able to recognize it because remember, there's no space for us in the world of Archigram. It's a space for other generations. And I, I, I'm basically saying, look, I think what's great about this moment, this moment, which is a huge compliment to the Archigram group is a totally deserved moment of taking seriously, uh, taking this work more seriously even than they, uh, what's great about this migration to M plus is that we simply uh, don't know uh, what's going to happen. So we have to sort of stay tuned, right? Because we live in a world that's completely about transmission, uh, uh, wireless transmission, electromagnetic 
vibrations. This is the world that Fuller and Price and Vaxman dreamed of. We, we live in that world now. That's not the world of the future. That's the world that we live in. And what's interesting is to watch the Archigam project keep following us wherever we go. It's a bit like a dog, you know? You kind of like this dog, but you told the dog to stay at home. And no matter where you go, there it is behind you, holding a bone, like another collage, another image, another document. This has become sort of amazing right now because there you get this image of television inserted into a world of the cell phone, of the radio. We have basically a wireless world. We get this kind of wired fantasy about television inserted into the wireless world that we live in. And I think this makes it totally uh, uh, exciting. My position is exactly not that, that archigrams should stay with the world of the wires. Rather, what's fascinating is to see what happens when the wireless world, a world of the imminent future, thinks about the world of the future imagined in the world of wireless. So we're in this kind of wired, 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 wired. And in this sense, I think um, it's a fantastic moment. It's enough for me, maybe too much for me. Um, I, but I think, you know, like um, the worst crime for M plus uh, would be to be boring. And if M plus does anything boring with this material, then I join the grumpy old man immediately. Thank you so much. That is such a needed, a needed provocation, a very unabashed rebuttal uh, on us, but also on Instagram, but a very productive one. I just want to thank you for that, Mark. Um, and I hope uh, by having you, just let, letting you end on that note, hope that there'll be more kind of like a hopeful thing to anticipate from what we can do here from M+. But yes, much to reflect on. And the next video response, uh, again, by even including this video response is our attempt to just be open to this multiple views of discordance. Um, and so, yeah, we'll be playing uh, Akigam's video response to the so-called presentations. I'm quite in personally interested in the in the Izazaki yeah. conversation because it mostly is to do with me and Izazaki and teaching together in LA. Yeah. Meeting originally at, at, at uh, Milan, as you know, and uh, the differences between his Milan exhibit and our, it, it, says, it, it effectively, he says that, you know, our, Milan exhibit was sort of cheerful and, and you know, the, the yeah. great big bag and so on, uh, and the popular pack. And, and Izazaki's was, was very beautiful, but, but, but slightly morbid, slightly sort of pessimistic, even at that time. The one I remember mostly from Milan was um, Holine. Was it Holine with his machine that churned out? Hans Holine. Glasses. Spectacles. Yeah, I thought that was very cool. Mm. Mm. What Anat says early on in his piece is that uh, our stuff was sort of in, implied being made of plastics at exactly the same time as Azaki went into brute concrete. Mm. And then later, you know, we weren't so interested in symbolism or art theory. That's what this guy says. Mm. Uh, and in fact, Izaki's stuff was full of symbolism and art theory. Mm. And then he, he got, comes on to the Osaka capsule. Uh, but the, the fact that although Izaki worked on that uh, plaza and so on, he very quickly after that expo sort of backtracked mm. on, on, on the robot and, and <coughs> really wanted to talk about the robot. And then he, the guy says that, you know, there's a, in Archigram today, at least there's a sort of intellectual link between that and the sort of instant hospitals that have been built in China for COVID. Mm. Uh, or in England as well. Yeah. And uh, then he talks about dismantling. But I, what is this? He says, Izazaki is too much, Izazaki says it's too much technology, but he then keeps pointing out the fact that, that Izazaki and I keep appearing uh, on platform together and talking, you know, that it's a that it's an interpretational difference rather than a opposite sides of the firing line. Uh, but I was obviously interested in that one. Uh, Roger Wu, the archigram spirit in Hong Kong, 
uh, and he goes on, I mean, in the, in the abstract, because I haven't seen the final thing, about walkways and consumerism, and that we, un we did not address social phenomena and then, what does he mean? Address it. I thought I. You know, I just took that down as a note from what he'd written. Yeah, I see. And then the the jet the, the Greek guy, I assume he's Greek for his name, has dug up a couple of Russian. Did you see that stuff? Mm, okay. Which is sort of I thought was a bit neither here nor there actually. And yeah. To to be honest, very much you know, he shows Warren's capsules and so on, and then he shows a rather. Okay. Oh. I, I haven't seen this thing. I it was just the plug-in architecture. Plug-in communism. I didn't enjoy that phrase at all. Mm. Yeah, I thought the stuff he dug up. I mean, he gets he just at the very end of his he shows the Nair group, but the, I think the main guy, the Nair group, died. Oh. The guy that we met in in uh, in um, he died soon afterwards. But they. they in the picture, there seems to be a whole lot of them, but I've never heard what happened to the others. I don't think it, it, it's sort of a very, I don't think he sustains that it was a major outfit. I mean, if you compare it with all the other interesting people that cropped up around that time all over the place, uh, the only interesting thing is that they were in Russia. You know what I mean? But yeah. in, a, in a level playing field, I don't think their stuff would, would attract any I'm being a bit sour about it but <laughs> I don't think it's worth the slot the conversation I, mean, I, just, I take the other more interesting is the influence of early Soviet architecture on our Absolutely. Early, early days of students really and how yeah. it came back again into uh, into archigram and then was re reinterpreted I think but with because it was so bold wasn't it mm. I mean, there's one guy who's always on on Facebook, who's called Yuri Avakimov, who's also a friend of these other Russian friends of mine who have the the schools, you know, the schools for kids, the Kerpachovs. And Avakimov is has often produced stuff that is sort of neo-constructivist drawings, and he's quite he's a nice, talented guy. So there's a little ember of that that sort of trails on but he's nothing to do with this these these groups that are mentioned here yeah. i mean i think there's a tendency for sort of scholars to look for something that nobody's bothered with and then milk it for all it's worth which is all right if they if they hit on something good <laughs> I, I think these guys i i remember when i first went to the bartlett there was a guy i can't remember his name who was russian uh, and then it was his friend who'd been at the aa who then went back to Russia. And these two guys fed me with a lot of funny pictures of stuff, which I've mostly lost by weird Siberian architects doing really weird, 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 spooky stuff. Uh, and then of course there's all the paper architects of whom I think have come off as, as one. Uh, and they did these, you know, the paper architecture stuff, which is a bit sort of formal, but could be claimed to be linked in some very roundabout way. So this character, Kotsouris, hasn't hasn't been interested in them. It reminded me more of a sort of abstract, what I read, for a sort of application to do a PhD or something. Yeah, like. yeah, it's yeah. Kind of... It probably is exactly that, mate. You can smell a, a mile off. Yeah. Well, as I thought, look, I haven't seen Mark Wickley, what he's done, but his little piece it looks like his brain is sort of working and he asked this question at the end and i thought that was at last somebody's asking a question which is that's always what has interested me about architecture really was the question that it the questions that it puts out which are where he talks about the, as being born in the golden age of tv which it, which is quite different from the, the era that we inhabit now Mm -hmm. We we'd never anticipated this, would we? No. If we no, never anticipated when we're eighty years old, we're going to be staring at some poxy little screen, not knowing where it, we we are, but knowing what the time is. You know, that's important. It's the time, isn't it? It's not. 
that Mike is in New York is what time? We, we've only good. got his abstract, right? We haven't got any actual. Uh, no, that's all we've got, yes. Yeah. So he that's starts right. off by saying multiple returns for next, nearly 60 years. Mm. Do not adjust your set. I guess mm. that's referring to the, yeah. the apparatus, I don't know. Anyway. But Mark's way of writing is refreshingly unacademic, isn't it? Yeah. I, I felt it's much more in the spirit of archigram, the way Mark writes his piece. Um, well, he's actually witty. He's, he's, he's brilliantly witty when he lectures, you know, he, whether you agree with everything or not. He, he always yeah. puts it in such a way. He, I mean, he's the only lecturer. I remember years ago at the Bartlett, he came and did something. And I actually had a stitch in my side from laughing. I mean, I laughed so much in that lecture. <laughs> I had a, you know, when you get a stitch in your side. Yeah. I, and that was just straight up and down, you know. It was just very, very funny. Yeah. Uh, yes, you're, you're, I think you're, 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 most of these things are very po-faced, aren't they? Yeah. Um, we, 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 hopefully, archogram never works. I, I always mm. like that about archogram. We could laugh at ourselves, you know, that humour was a tool. It wasn't a way. Uh, I think some people have assumed that the English humour is, um, they're not taking it seriously. It's not not that at all, is it? Humour can be away. New Zealander. Seriously. Pardon? Wiggly's a New Zealander. Is he? Yeah. <laughs> He's British, then. Well. Colonial. Yeah. Well, I don't do anything. Just uh, tell me to shut up. I'm creep away. Mm -hmm. No, I think one last thing about Mark is the other speakers, the other guests, um, very serious about it all. Mark has the way of phrasing his thoughts that imply the wit and elegance, I hope, that we wanted Archogram to be about. Um, is that that tone of Parte les Bourgeois, the French 19th century poets, ridiculing the bourgeoisie and Peter's phrase about um, what was it he said got the rear got the drearies on the run Mark's got the sense of that mm. whereas the others haven't they, they treat it as a very serious business a bit too serious I think my impression no I, I'd agree with that I just thought if when did Dennis edits this, got the drearies on the run. That should be at the end, really. I think that puts it for me quite eloquently, Michael. But I don't know. I wonder who the drearies are. You see, who would, if we were young now, who would be the drearies? Do you think? Any idea? Nearly everybody, but <laughs> everybody. No, I mean, <laughs> Nearly no, everybody I... except us. Uh, if we were young now, we'd know who the drearies were. One of the subjects of this symposium is that Hong Kong could be called an archigram city. And I think that's one of the points this first guy, mm. Roger Wu, is out to make. Do we agree with that or? Complete bollocks, actually. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. The only bit that's archigram for me personally uh, is the is the sort of three dimensional aspect of it, particularly the bit where you get those escalators that go up and up and up. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's really interesting. But I mean, the the its its use of the harbour <laughs> is neither here nor there. There's nothing special they do with the harbour. Nothing special they do with those enormous slab blocks. You know, there's nothing special they do on the top of hills. There's nothing special. They don't plug anything in. You, they don't you mean, do anything uh, that interesting with the boats. Mm -hmm. I think that, that for me, the only interesting thing is that. But it's a, it's what is it? It's a, you, you mean the a commercial city on a beautiful site. You mean the external escalators? Yeah. That's something I was thought was very quite archigram. And also yeah. there, was a, there was a free elevated freeway near our hotel that just swooped between some high-rise buildings. I've got a photograph I can send to you all on, on my phone. 
Yes, it, it was right up in yeah. the end, and you thought, well, that's quite hard to ground because it was really uncompromising. City. Pardon? It's the three-dimensional city. Yes. But only a part of Arkham, because the other part is, is to do with like the way of of thinking, which is like like Michael, you know, sort of connecting things like a cushion and a vehicle and coming up with with, with a project. That's the the real the, the another side of Arkham, which you, which you don't particularly find in Hong Kong, I don't think, but it could be there. Mm -hmm. It's funny because in a funny way, uh, there are more bits and bobs in Singapore that could be seen as sort of yeah. archigram thinking than in Hong Kong by far. There's far more funny people doing funny experiments with yes. things yes. attached yes. to things and vegetation and also, you know, it's, it's much more exploratory. Hong Kong tends to be a business town. Yes. And its thinking is of a business town. And yeah. it doesn't seem to allow any funky stuff to creep in. No. Whereas Singapore, you know, at a certain level does allow funky stuff to creep in. Well, it's really a result of the terrain in Hong Kong, isn't it? The fact that it's sloping up almost vertically and you drive up, you start at the base of the building, you find yourself halfway up and you're still in the car driving. It's not... Uh, the result of a new three-dimensional city thinking. You know, when I went there some years ago, I found I was staying in a hotel in the central area, and the pedestrian walkways, the way that they were starting to develop them as a separate city net from the road transport, I thought was interesting. But since we've been there more recently, we've not had the opportunity to to have a look at those. Unless, have you seen, been on them, Peter, at all in your visits? No, no, I can't call this to mind, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's the three-dimensional thing. It's the one claim. And whether it's circumstantial or by sort of wit, I think Mike's right. I think it's more circumstantial. But on the other hand, there are other cities that have that climb up a steep hill and don't stick interesting sort of escalator systems and on them. All, uh, although there are a, there is a couple of other examples that come to mind. One is uh, the back of Barcelona near the Park Well. There's a series of connected escalators. And there's another one behind Universal Studios in LA. And then the only other, other examples I can think of is in Haifa, there's an underground railway that goes diagonally just inside the ground. And then there's a similar one-stop version in Istanbul. And then I draw a blank. I mean, that's about the extremity of diagonal 3D city things. There's probably are some others somewhere. Oh, and Valparaiso, which has, had lots and lots of late 19th century cliff lifts, of which there are only, when we were there, there are only oh. two still working. They had about 11 of them. So it's the town's in a, in a dip, <laughs> surrounded by a hill. And it has a whole lot of these cliff lifts that went round and round and round and round and round. And now they've replaced them by a bus service, which is a bit tragic. <laughs> I mean, that's a sort of, again, these places are circumstantial you know they happen to have a lot of hill and then they think how the hell do we get people up the hill without uh, up? could i it's a rather banal question why is it this zoom three why is it called transmissions what is it about that word i i just i know i don't know whether you any of you i just can't feel if when we were young we would just think this convent was very dull, you know, and not. But I think one was telling them that a year ago, Dennis. I mm. remember a conversation in Hong Kong with those two ladies. Maybe yeah. you weren't there, but I remember mm. telling them that it was, you know, very academic and very stiff. I said it's... Yes. But they, they were already determined 
to do it because they have their own boxes that they're ticking, I'm sure. Mm. You know, I've, I, I've, I think we've all hit this before that, that I mean, classic cases of tick box using archigram it was you know uh, westminster with, yes i mean i, th I think and, and there, there are other mi more minor examples of you know you get a bit yeah. of archigram in there and you've ticked a box yeah and, and they're not really interested in I, I my big bone of contention is i don't think they're really interested in what we think or what we did or what we believe that we did but god those guys are still alive so we'll round them up yeah would be much more useful to them when we're dead because then they, we won't be able to answer back. But even when we try and answer back, uh, make irritating comments about what we think. And anyhow, each of us has a different view of what actually happened. Yeah, that's a good way of finishing the thing, Dennis. I like that. Yeah. No, I think mm. that's true. Mm. We've got the drearers on the run. We've got the drearers on the run. The drearers on the run. <laughs> we're, the, we're the dear breweries. Okay. It, it, guys, it's daunting task to wrap up now. So, <laughs> now uh, uh, let me try to uh, sort of a recap. You know, so far for me, the, the most uh, uh, sort of the strangest and also most interesting part of the, uh, this uh, symposium is that after uh, the panelists engaging beautiful presentation, then we hear archigrams, a vicious attack, like <laughs> smashing the panelist presentation one by one. It's really uh, amusing. And uh, now let, let me try to uh, recap. Roger said Hong Kong is archigram city. Then archigram said, no, it's all substantial. Uh, it's not, not circumstantial and uh, got no 3D dimensional thinking. And uh, it's mostly a boring business town. And uh, after Ariel said, Isosaki found the, the, the common passion with archigram in counterculture. And uh, then Peter Cook said, uh, uh, Isosaki is too pessimistic, uh, brutal, concrete, too uptight, and uh, too much symbolism. And uh, after Evangelist said, uh, archigram serves a fresh air, penetrating the iron cur the curtain of uh, Soviet Union. Archigram said, uh, it's not worth of a, <laughs> a slot. And uh, I was, oh my God, how, how the heck to reconcile this antagonism between scholars and, uh, and the Archigram members. Then, uh, 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 and thanks God, Mark Weekly <laughs> offers psychoanalysis. <laughs> Archigram guys, a bunch of grumpy old men and they're feeling so bitter of giving their kids <laughs> to Hong Kong and to be abused by M plus museum. And uh, then Mark gives a very beautiful sort of a description about archigrams essentially as a TV channel, a virtual reality broadcasting that uh, uh, dissolves architecture and the city, which is actually much more timely than their own like a young moment right now. Right? So uh, I like to so we try to weave all this together by saying, okay, if we we go back first, we go back to uh, Arius Isozaki, right? His the dissolution of architecture and the city, and uh, as uh, Ariel said beautifully, has always you know been double edged, right? It, it, it can be as playful, cheerful as Archigram's instant city, can be tragic as tragic, as disastrous as Hiroshima, right? That's how actually Isozaki was deemed as pessimistic by Peter Cook, right? Then we, we jump to Mark Wigley's um, sort of a, a statement and uh, analysis of archigram. And I, I wanna cut into the, uh, the current moment right now. So uh, my question to all of you, maybe also to archigram, you, know, uh, uh, you guys, you know, Peter Cook, and Dennis Crompton, you can cut in any moment. So let's say today, if media technology does have the capacity of dissolving architecture and the city, right? as Mark Wigley also, also said, Mark said it's almost like too much for himself. <laughs> right? If they is becoming the reality or does have the capacity of you know, making it as a reality, are we after all happy with that today? And uh, in other words, I want to also throw the question back to Archigram. 
is archigram is going to be a more serious question maybe than what archigram expected it's uh, the archigrams is it sort of unconditional uh, optimism about technology the capacity of technology of dissolving city uh, and architecture uh, sufficient today for us to think about architecture and urbanism yeah so sort of one one question so we two side yeah mark you want you want to jump in okay um you know as a as a uh, grumpy not so not so uh, young person myself i i defend the right of archigram to be uh, <laughs> i mean class. thank you <laughs> so it's a bit like um uh, in this moment archigram uh, sits on a on a throne and various entertainers come up and they say no 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 to everybody um of course because because uh it's weird, right? If, if somebody was really good, like really exciting, that's also a problem, right? So it's kind of a, a very, it sort of vibrates there. Yeah. I, I think that for, for me, for example, the Isazaki uh, research and the Soviet research, incredibly interesting, super not boring. Mm -hmm. um, precisely, and I thought Ariel cap captured so, so beautifully that, that there is this very strange uh, friendship between what looks pessimistic in, in, in Iso's case and looks so happy uh, in, in, uh, in Archigram's case. I try to suggest Archigram's not happy at all, but they make, let's say, images of happiness. And it's possible, ESO, not so pessimistic, actually, trying to, so actually this, this relationship is very important. Mm -hmm. and, and I really am interested in the work of, of both because, because they are challenging architecture. They, they are putting architecture on trial. So in this moment of the, let's say, 60s and 70s, there, there is amazing work being done to challenge every assumption of what, what is building, what is architecture, what is the future. This, this is what I love of Archigram precisely. It's, it's so good at, at, at making you think again about what is architecture. So, so I think this was interesting, very interesting research. And, and, and in, in Vangelis's work on the Soviets, again, amazing because you don't expect it. You think, you, think, you know, maybe more, more stupid things have been said about Archigram than almost anybody else, right? They have accumulated just so much stupidity that of course they have developed the habit of, uh, of cleaning themselves all the time from all this shit that keeps coming. Uh, and, and part of the shit is, 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 is sort of easy association of Archigram with let's say capitalism and so on. So, so it's great to see what happens actually when Archigram's ideas go right to the heart of Soviet system and to the system part of the system. I think Evangel was brilliant in showing it's not the radical magazine, not the experimental magazine, but the official magazines of, of state authority find this. So again, I think with both Isuzaki and the Soviet, what I find really fantastic and non-boring about these two researchers is that they help us to see Archigram within a different lens, right? And I think for me, see Archigram more radical um, both the kind of deep pessimism about, about society, about technology, about uh, genocide even on one side and, and kind of a socialist experiment on, on, on the other. And I think, let's say this is our, our, our job is not to make uh, Archigram happy. That's not possible, by the way. You know, they can't do it, we, we can't do it. Yeah. Uh, but happiness for architecture as a field would be to f find in the Archigram project a network because Archigram is very social, a network of kindred spirits around the world in that moment that were challenging uh, uh, what we think. And I think this is the, I would say, responsibility of M plus is to keep alive the, the challenge. And it's, it's difficult in a museum because museums almost by definition are seen to be places that uh, consolidate and, and make rigid. So if M, M plus makes Archigram solid and rigid, this is why I say I become grumpy too, because that's boring. Uh, the main point is not even to celebrate Archigram, just to allow a reflection on the archive to keep uh, architecture uneasy, uncomfortable. The worst is when architects think they know what architecture is. And, and what was young and new of Archigram is they made everybody who was an architect for a moment at least uncertain, that, you know, uncertain about whether they had the truth. Uh, and I think this is still ma mainly true because uh, architects are, um, 
uh, quite often uh, extremely boring. Uh, Mark, what about today? Because uh, you, both area and you mentioned that dissolution of architecture in the city by the current Zoom, Zooming, right? Yeah. That, that, that makes on the one hand architecture more relevant to today, but also I somehow feel like tragic is like the reality for us to all like, you know, dissolve ourselves through this virtual reality communication. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, I, well, I'm interested what Ariel thinks, but, but just very quickly, I'm, I suppose I'm a historian or something like this, which means that for me to think about cell phones, we have become a new species with the cell phone, right? It's the thing that we first touch in the morning and first touch at night. It's part of our body, part of our brain. So we have become a new species, but how to understand the species, we have to look back like Marshall McLuhan, look back at the previous technology. So if we, if we can, if we are stupid about television, we're going to be even more stupid about the cell phone. So for me, uh, Archigram can continue to be teachers, right? And I think they are teachers, like really teachers, like in schools and, and also in the field, they are teachers. And, and one can look at what they were saying about this previous moment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in order to try to understand the moment of the present and to decide whether to be pessimistic or, or, or not. I mean, just think, imagine that I write a science fiction novel and in this novel, a teenager will own a company and this company will have almost half of the world's citizens agree to give all of their private communication as the property of that company and that company will know no limit, right? If I offer this as a novel, uh, uh, nobody buys it. They say it's ridiculous, but that's Facebook. So we live now in a world that's so shocking so astounding, the biggest monopoly in the history of the planet in which every piece of information about your sexual, economic, personal life belongs to all privacy, belongs to one company run by a teenager that's trust, trying to understand now whether or not um, should be a good person or not. So, so that's the situation we're in. So this, it's very hard to be, let's say, simply optimistic, but at least we have to look at uh, our colleagues in the history of architecture that have challenged architecture's self-confidence. And this is, this is how I see uh, Archigram. Th they do so, just to finish the speech, with all of the tricks of the architect, right? The drawings, the details, you know, they care, like Vaxman, they care how things are made. Precisely because if you really care, it gets unmade. Anyway, Ariel, what do you think? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I think one of the, um, the thing, well, while listening to you, Mark, uh, and thank you for, for, for the comment, um, what struck me is that the word transmission for a long time and television as well was not really about communication. It was unidirectional. And it was more about consuming something uh, from other people, uh, even if it's news, but it wasn't really reciprocal. And only in the last maybe... 10 years has this medium become something where we actually exchange. Uh, and only in the last year uh, do we actually see the limits of it, you know, the frustration uh, when this is the only way that we communicate. Something I think is missing. Uh, so, and I wonder when, you know, if the word transmission here is actually not, doesn't belong actually to the past. Uh, and now we should use a different word for this. Um, and, and, you know, the, the television has shifted or disappeared, and now we have this interface, which is all of a sudden, you know, you hear me and I hear you, there is an exchange, this is more about communication, uh, but it's a different type of pleasure. It's a very frustrated pleasure. Uh, before that, you knew the limits of it. You knew that, you know, you can, you receive and you can do whatever you want with it. Today, you have to give something back. So. We're, it, it, this is baby steps into this new technology. We are not, we're not there yet. That's probably why it's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, in the archigram, um, you know, whether you interpret it as pleasure, uh, you know, we're happy people. Uh, at the time, at least there was, you know, keeping, you know, um, the technology within uh, certain limits. Uh, was something that let people dream of what it could do, but it didn't actually do it yet. Um, and today, you know, we see that, mm, it's, you know, maybe in the future, you know, maybe it's gonna get there, uh, but all the science fiction, you know, novels and the manga that you read, you know, that uh, double-sided communication existed already, you know, in the minds of people. 
but not in reality. Uh, so, you know, that's something that I think maybe in the history of writing about transmission and the role of television, there's a moment of that shift, um, which is, you know, the last 10 years. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, it, just by the way, I think happy people are really annoying. I mean, they're irritating, right? Um, and um, unfortunately, architecture in general portrays itself as, as being in the, in the business of manufacturing happiness. So that's why you don't see sad people or ill people or lonely people, or you, you only see happy people. So, yeah. Yeah. Forever, yeah, so, so modern, it's, forever young and forever exactly. Yeah. yeah, so the, the, the Dylan song is playing all the time in, in architecture, right? For, forever young. And, and for, for the rest of us, which is to say most of us that are lonely and confused and, and unsure, full of questions, uh, this, is, this image of happiness, it seems to me of no real use uh, in, in this current situation. And the little thought I would, little reaction to, to Ariel, I think you're, you're absolutely right about the interactivity. Fuller and Vaxman and Price were very much about in, interactive TV, right from the, from the, from the beginning. And, and what I notice is of course, that in the age in which everybody has an opinion and so on, actually authoritarian systems are doing very well. So it turns out that maybe the logic of transmission, like you say, uh, is actually alive and well, uh, somehow smuggled inside uh, the logic of interaction. Um, and so again, I, I would say architects could get in there and sort of figure out how it's possible um, that uh, these horrific decisions are made by collectivities, which seem to be guided by media messages of a very particular kind with very particular architects. So there's another group of architects out there I don't know. I don't want to be. Um, conspiracy theories are always there, but I just, you know, hate happy people. I just want to add one more thing about you know what I learned from this interaction is that it seems to me really that uh, at least Cook. I don't know about the other members, but Cook and Isozaki were sort of kind of alter egos of each other. Isozaki was very quickly kind of um, you know went back to the aspects of pleasure and and tactile architecture and you know symbolism and all of that, and it's kind of. It seems that in certain ways, Cook in his later years, um, and he would maybe is here, he wants to correct me, uh, but connected more and more to that. Um, so of course you can find in the, in the original archigram drawings some you know, concern with uh, you know, humanistic aspects, what Isozaki called the humanistic aspects. But it was, you know, the, the, the definition of pleasure was maybe a little bit kind of uh, distant. Uh, and with the years, that side kind of gained more, um, place but it's always I'm always interested to see how you know people from other cultures and with all the uh, probably a lot was lost in translation I mean Isozaki's English is not perfect uh, and there are also a lot of understatements both on Cook's side and Isozaki and therefore the communication all the ambivalence in it it was so, it was so productive because they could actually interpret whatever they wanted in the other person and see oh that's actually, you know, a version of the future that I, hmm, I could actually, uh, you know, go into. Um, so anyway, that's in, in terms of the kind of cross-cultural um, uh, aspects of communicating. Uh, regarding, Ty, you know, to respond to your question about media, I was thinking also that, you know, the, the, the Zoom wave of Archigram was supposed to be this gentle, breezy wave that would arrive over time in the, and take us to this future moment where all these things that are displayed work. Mm -hmm. And in our situation, we were kind of forced overnight to run with this tsunami. And that's so the kind of the limits of, of, of these kind of mediatic technologies that we use, which are all based on architectural metaphors, if you think about it. And uh, the idea of the web page, the online forum, the gallery, the channel, the firewall, all of the internet is constructed through architectural um, keywords and, and concepts. And I think that that brings us to the question of media, specifically what's interesting with Archigram is that they, they were interaction designers, they were communication specialists, they were uh, blurring all these boundaries for which we have very compartmentalized kind of expertise. Uh, today and that, that that's what's fascinating that they questioned what does the architect do in the end you know is, is it about drawings is it about buildings what, what the hell is it exactly and testing this hypothesis in different contexts 
uh, makes you understand more about how other architects, what kind of, kind of sandboxes they had to play with, what were the limitations and what, what were the opportunities. Eventually, your presentation that sort of instantly brings me back to your presentation, back to the Soviet uh, context. I was thinking, we have like now we have two extremes now. I say the po two extreme uh, um, um, consequences, possible consequences. One is that the unbearable dreary of being like it's so boring, like to design or to live in the design uh, product. On the other hand the unbearable lightness of being, like everything dissolved into virtual reality, probably is, that's not, you know, either way, not the, what Archigram really wants. As you said, the interaction, the interactive, uh, 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 even the machine still the, celebrates the, the relationship of, between the human being in a tangible way somehow, right? I, I, I wish we could you know, uh, hear more of from Archigram members Dennis, do you want to unmute yourself? You, you, yeah. Are you happy with basically? Are you happy with the current situation? Like dominant, so much by virtuality, like telecommunication technology. Is that what you have been like dream, dreamed of? It's not something I'm particularly aware of. I, I am where I am. But uh, I'm curious, are you guys, why you guys are not that happy when you hear this kind of extraordinary influences of Archigram and being like yeah, through this transmission of your TV channel uh, to all over the world to have either mutations or inspirations and uh, you keep insisting on, insisting on the, the authenticity of a signal not to be yeah, what, what, what kind of a psychology? <laughs> I have a tendency to bang on and on, so I'm going to be very brief. Um, two things about Mark Wigley's uh, speech, of course, as usual, he's, he's brilliant. <laughs> and he, he massages up. Yes. He wants to be, wanted to be spikier than it is. I, yeah, grumpy. I don't mind being grumpy when grump is usual. But the dream or nightmare of the museum, number one, I think the museum is, is really, as everybody's been saying, it's an opportunity to be a springboard. And I don't, I don't care if future generations, you know, shit on it or, you know, make sunglasses out of whatever the hell. The other thing he's, he was a bit wrong about moving east. I, I think he has a problem about England, but moving east and south. I, I, in the last few years, have been banging on endlessly about Australia. I think it's really a fantastic architecture country, how the South American countries are fantastic. And, and that China is going to do some really weird shit stuff any, 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 any minute. Now, back onto the, the conversation about, and, and also he was, he was really good on, on saying that he didn't use the word coalition, but I use the word coalition. I think that future historians on Archigram should really do a lot, a lot, a lot of psychoanalysis of us as individuals because it was a coalition of individuals. And I think then that comes on to the business personality, Dizazaki. Uh, if you are a teacher for so long, you become fantastically interested in people, anyhow I am. And actually what maybe very few people have noticed is that even some of the early drawings and certainly later ones, have a lot of anecdote written into them. A simple example, the robots are named after two people that we knew. And that, that when I do a drawing, even now, I write a story into it. I'm thinking of people alive and dead who would appreciate some of the moves being made architecturally. But I'm also writing a scenario for the town or for the thing or for the building. And, and you know, I'm doing that as I, even this week, on the one hand in a building, on the other hand in drawings, where one's building in how you imagine the people will use the building, tricks that you want to goad them into doing certain things, how you imagine the people inhabiting the drawing might be. And that comes largely from teaching, from psychoanalyzing thousands of students who become one's friends, one's colleagues, whatever. 
uh, that personality is in it. And that is also the cue, clue, I think, to the Uzazaki thing. I think the key to it was, yeah, we hit it off very early on, just liking each other. But we did, for about a four-month period in LA, I think this is critical, we spent virtually every day, every, certainly every second day when we weren't teaching, going around LA, looking at stuff, looking, we went through the entirety of the David Gephardt book. And in, in hours and hours and days and days and days of sort of asides and remarks and sort of quizzing each other and all sorts of things, you get to know the other person, you get to enjoy the repartee you really get inside the personality. And I think in the occasions when Israel and I ever had the chance to meet, it's like as if we were, you know, talking the day before. We, we get off and we get off on, on stupid things and ironic things and occasionally deep things and all sorts of things. We've seen each other in a number of different predicaments and so on. And, and I think that, like doesn't come out, that doesn't, that can't be quantified. So personality is in there, teaching is in there. And so the story and the conversation mm. is embedded in the drawing, not just the, the broad brush headlines of what, you, what people think you're doing or what even you say you're doing. Underneath what you say you're doing, there's a whole lot of little funny conversations, just as you have in a tutorial with a student, not what the end result is, but how you, how you get there. Now, how you can make that come through in a museum, the ball is in their court. Yeah, but he's a and, and if final thing, uh, apropos Mark, it, he says, yeah, we were living inside TV and the TV it's the future. So we're, are we not living inside, you know, were we not wanting to live inside the future? I think that, he, so get, he's onto something very definitely there. We were wanting to be inside the future. And whatever we could draw was, was just a sort of hint, could be no more than a hint. Mm. Mark, you want a response because uh, if, if somehow I feel from uh, Archigram's members, uh, the tone that the drawings are propositional rather than a, a sort of a, a, a um, absolute projection to the future they want. Yep, want right, right, right. And somehow we treat this a more like a concluding statement and uh, for the future. Is that kind of uh, the, uh, you, you have to, yeah, sure, you have to unmute Mark. Mark, you have to, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, actually, I love this. Um, uh, Peter and I have many things in common, I think, uh, uh, some good. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the idea that you could mute, mute Peter is a contradiction in terms and the idea that you could mute me is a contradiction in terms. I love this thing in Zoom where they say, could you unmute yourself? Um, yeah. It seemed to me Archigram unmuted itself all the time. Um, they were supposed to stay quiet and, and uh, so this sort of- All of them not. Uh, yeah, the sort of unmuting. <laughs> but also in my, in, in my defense, because I'm defensive to the core, uh, Peter's absolutely right. It's a colonial uh, problem and so all of that. Um, but I ask you to listen to what Peter just said. So he put together, uh, we are living in the television, television is the future, therefore we're living in the future. This is the work of a theorist, right? So this is, this is a typical Peter, typical archigram, I would say. They're thinking through the consequences, step by step by step. And also I very much agree, not that agreement matters, right? But, but this, this idea of the narrative, the storytelling, and it's not just the story, let's say, in the drawings, it's the very fact of the archive. And then, you know, over the all these years, you know, for, for me, archigram is a little bit like a virus I can't get out of the, my system. So every now and then it, it, it reemerges. And this usually leads to an email or message to Dennis looking for an image. Uh, uh, and, and, and of course, the, the, the keeping of the archive, the manufacture of the archive is part of the storytelling 
uh, system or it enables the storytelling to, to uh, continue. So um, it's really, I, I would say a form, almost you could say a form of literature or not literature like the boring, boring poetry, et cetera, but it's a kind of writing, like a kind of speaking. And I like very much uh, Peter's idea that it's a kind of teaching or that it comes from experiences teaching. And I, I ins again, insist on this point that they are teachers and, and, so the, the problem is not so much, you know, normally you would phrase the question that Peter just asked, like, what does it mean to take kind of exciting experimental architecture and put it into the museum? And this is, you know, that's the kind of normal puzzle. I think the deeper puzzle is what does it mean to take teaching into the museum? Because teaching is by definition unstable. The purpose of teaching is, is that your student be more interesting than you, right? That, so you try to create a hospitality to things you cannot yourself do. Um, so how to, how to bring Archigram into the archive in such a way that the museum is also able to do things that it couldn't do before. Like even M plus becomes something, a different kind of place. This for me is the spirit. And this means, uh, you know, storytelling, narrative story and, and, and also respect. I think part of the museum thing is just simply to respect um, the work of Archigram. And that doesn't mean put a, put a prize on it or even like it. It means just uh, study it. Uh, and I think for this, the, the Dennis's work in, in, in constructing the archive is so important because it, it is a form of hospitality. It says, okay, here's the stuff. Uh, take a look. Uh, what do you think? Uh, and, and I think this, uh, what do you think is a little bit, maybe could have been written at the bottom of every single drawing of Archigram. What do you think? You know, uh, you don't have to go with us, but this, what do you think? What do you think? And, and I, also something else, it's a bit boring thing to say, a bit romantic, but I, I mentally I try to remove any one of the six from the group and it doesn't work. Like in my mind, including, you know, uh, Ron and w Warren, it's very, very interesting that the, these differences, these disagreements and these different personalities, you know, it wouldn't work with five, I think. Uh, it worked with six, maybe it would have worked with seven. But I personally can't imagine Archigram with any one of the six removed. And then, of course, something else is if you look into every, every single project of Archigram, there are other names. Like the six is just the sort of core, core group. And Isazaki becomes, let's say, part of the, you know, the insight, not simply by being published, but he's part of that conversation. So I think there is this network, a kind of social media, if you like, uh, uh, of people. And if the people that run that network are teachers, they have the spirit of teachers. So they want to be, they want to participate or even feel some pride in something happening that they didn't produce. Then good stuff happens, in my opinion. Then, you know, there are plenty of other incredible experimental architects who were only interested in, in kind of anti-teaching, you know, like a, just their, you know, I, I don't know. I'm a, I'm, I guess I'm a fan. That's what I'm saying. Ariel, do you want to ask the question directly to Peter? You, you, we have to really unmute everyone now. So no, Peter, I, I'm basically I'm asking the question for uh, Ariel. No, I'm unmuted, so I think I go can ahead. Go that. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering uh, the compared to the visions of uh, the optimistic visions of what you know this telecommunication would be in in the archigram days. Uh, I wonder if Peter or Dennis want to say, are, are they happy with the way Zoom functions today? Or is this a real disappointment of what the future is? Um, and the, the other uh, question I have is more, you know, to Peter, uh, there was uh, an exchange that I think is pretty funny where uh, Peter uh, told uh, Isozaki that it's only a coincidence that he didn't become a metabolist. And Isozaki, uh, and he actually uh, in, uh, Peter in his book first labels Isozaki as a metabolist and Isozaki protests. He actually writes, you know, I protested that I am not a metabolist. And I wonder if, you know, in later years, uh, Cook was actually relieved that Isozaki was not a metabolist because, you know, he, you know, Archigram and the metabolist actually had disagreements uh, and Isozaki, the exchange with Isozaki was much more fertile. Uh, so these are two uh, kind of questions. I wonder if, you know, Cook wants to um, respond. Oh, I think it's a, it's a conversation I'd love to have with you over a few glasses and it'd probably take a whole evening and we would, because uh, uh, reading, um, what's the name of the guy who did the book? 
of the Japanese book. Uh, Daniel. Yeah, D Daniel. Thomas Daniels. Thomas Daniels' book is fascinating because it go it it, it provides the fact uh, that a lot of the Japanese who I thought were just good at producing things were in fact very, very involved in uh, discussion, involved in academic positioning, were very, they had to state their, their beliefs as well, even the ones you think are the most flippant. In fact, when you, and, and that leads me to realize that one's only scratching the surface I've been fantastically inspired by not only Arata but several others, you know, and, and it's it's impressively so. And and yet, I only scratching the surface. So that raises the whole thing of what do you read from the person, what do you read from the stuff, and what do you then think when you started to to unravel the relationships, fantastic differences between them, but then alliances and so on. Now, if the museum can deal with that, I it just want to catch the idea. I think it should go through the archive very carefully and not only have, you know, the classic drawings up on the wall or in the sh shelf, whatever, wherever they put them on, on the film, but the stuff in between, the half done drawings, the scribbles, the rubbish stuff, uh, but this thing with Izazaki is very, very complex, but mostly because we were mates in the, in the simple situation. We, we, we understand the irony of, of things together. Uh, I think there's far more for that aspect. I, I've, I've lost the question. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> were you happy to... Oh, yeah, metabolism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yell is in, in the corner here prompting me usefully. Um, I think it was probably a very complex relationship. And anyhow, there's the whole question of to what extent did Tangi mastermind metabolism and how did he use it? How did he push Kurokawa and Izazaki? He played them off against each other. All sorts of stories I've heard from Izo himself. And, and then I think it's, it's the media. What is in, interesting to me also is that there was Archigram but there were younger groups around us, followers or whatever the hell they were. Uh, one of the most prominent being Will Alsop, who had a number of groups. And then, there, you know, there was Cedric. And Cedric is the great mind of certainly not only British, but I think a key, key philosophical figure in, in architecture. And he was a friend, a, a very good friend. And we agreed to to not be interested in the same things. He would he would poke fun at me because I have a fascination for second rate architecture, oh. meaning I it amuses me to analyze it. I I used to say that he was incredibly boring when he'd come in with some statistic about how many fish had been you know landed in Grimsby that morning, and we used to sort of laugh about it, you know. And, and he was a fascinating character on, on many, many fronts. And he was there, but he, he, his, his style was different, but we were in the end on the same, very much conscious of being on the same side of the firing line, you know? So he was like a kind of uh, the same gen generation. He was like an uncle figure. And I think that's important. And I think what has been very good has been that these other people were there too, as, 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 as Mark pointed out, there are a number of names who appear on things. And there are a number of names the other side of the door. And the corollary is saying that when you do a drawing, you're putting storylines into it. When you're working on something, you're also talking to certain people in, in your mind. There's certain comments I said, I think Cedric will be amused by this. You know, or whoever it might be, will be amused by this, or this will upset. And the phrase that I think Ron in invented, this will upset them. We never said who the them were. They were the great unwashed Philistine or anybody that didn't describe, but, but they, were, they were an identifiable sort of person. 
in the London scene. You could almost do a cartoon of them. So all that's running, all that's running around. Yeah, is this Archibald's metabolism? So he must have had a very, not just philosophical odd relationship, but pers you know, the personalities. And centered on this, I've always been fascinated by the Izazaki Kurokawa thing. So different as people, so, so different, but inherently aware of each other the whole time. Yet Kurokawa is the one who executed your capsule for, uh, for Osaka, actually. Yeah. So you, you had an exchange with uh, Kurokawa, at least from that. You know, I, I, I met Kurokawa very, very many times, and the more times you met him, the more you knew how different he was from Suzaki. Yeah, I, uh, Eric, written your Eric and Mark, I just saw a, a, a comment written by Peter Nelson, brilliant comment, probably uh, uh, sir, to serve as a good concluding question to all of us that he he basically he he's suggesting that our sort of a reductive. Uh, uh, analogy between the current moment, the COVID-19 zooming with the uh, TV, a bit too reductive. Now he's suggesting that there might be a fundamental paradigm shift from the TV television technology in re relation to archigram the vision toward the architecture and technology. And from what we're sort of uh, experiencing now, we're sort of stepping into a new kind of a age uh, with the technology is so determined by uh, the big data and the uh, simulation etc could be that could be fundamentally different from the the uh, the tv the cell phone you were mentioning in relation to archigram so then the, the, the implication is that so the less boring or 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 more frightening future of architecture and the city uh, how to deal with that right and uh, the the history, let's say, the history of the legacy of archigram, or the, the the history of architecture in general, uh, can they still serve as a tool for us to investigate the future, or is there any other way? You know, so it's sort of you know, frightening, but a, a brilliant question opening up. Yeah, yeah. Um, a quick quick reaction. So, I suppose I'm I I love very much Marshall McLuhan's argument that. Um, each new technology is the is the medium in which you live, is your environment. So by definition, you don't see the environment like a fish doesn't see water or have a concept of water. So oh, yeah. McLuhan famously argues that you only see a technological environment. You only see the world you're living in when it's redundant, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in, re in reaction to this question, it's precisely the redundancy of television that makes it you know, something to, to, to look at. It's, it's the only thing we can look at. Uh, what I what I tried to say before, I say again, but for me, it's a question. Are we deeply in the world of television now, so deep that we don't recognize it as television, or are we in an, an, a new world? And, mm -hmm. and I, for me, it's an open question. It's not actually interesting to take aside. I explore the possibility of both possibilities. So, for example, I just made a book on Vaxman, which is only about Vaxman and television and show that he's obsessed with television. And mm -hmm. by the way, I, I think I'm right. And, and, and if, you, if you look at this obsession and you think it through and you think it through with him, you might not so easily think that the world we live in today is different than that. But let's just quickly return to the McLuhan point. By definition, we not only don't know what it means to live in the world of cell phones, cell phones is not even the world we're living in. That's just the part of the world that's visible to us because it's sufficiently old, right? So we, so even our conversations about what is the world we live in are, are kind of silly conversations because actually we are already living uh, beyond that. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm a member of the historians union, right? So I'm gonna say, yep, so you need historians because you gotta, you gotta, with McLuhan, look in the rear view mirror, but look carefully, like not stupidly, not be, if you're looking in the, in the rear view mirror, stop uh, sleepwalking or sleep driving. Mm -hmm. So I think the question is great. Is it a different world or a different world, different politics? But first do the research and you know, it's possible. 
that actually the world we are living in was perfectly designed uh, pre previously and artists did uh, capture it in, in a certain way. And, and again, I will allow the possibility to think of uh, Archigram in this category, this old category of the artist, right? If, if, as Peter says, the whole point is to, to make them uncomfortable, yeah, well, this is the voice of the artist, right? Shaking, rattling the cage, annoying. So maybe this shaking and rattling and annoying every now and then touched certain things that we are, are with today. So I, I, I guess it's, a, it's a, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Cell phone, I think, probably is really television in the way the television was conceived. Uh, it has to do with a certain idea about transmission precisely, about broadcast, about electromagnetic waves and so on. The world we actually live, on, live in, which is after the cell phone, the world we can't see, I only think we could get, you know, we could get to it. You know, McLuhan said that the role of the artist is to produce anti-environments. You know, a good way to make an anti-environment for a fish is to lift it out of the water. And then a fish goes, I have a concept. It's called water. And I want to go back there. So the role of the artist is to create a kind of anti-environment that lets you see the environment you're living in. And if you see it, to think differently and act differently. That's the question. The question is whether groups like Archigram and their colleagues, the sort of social media network, were able to interrupt the flow and make visible uh, uh, a world that we now encounter. And there are two possible answers. Yeah, they really showed it to us. They really showed us the media world that we now inhabit. But it's also possible if we do the research that there were other, uh, other worlds hi hiding there, you know, like uh, it's a question. And um, it's an urgent question because if we live in a world after the cell phone uh, and we are architects, uh, we, we need to engage with this engage with this. And that seems weird, right? That architects would talk about an invisible world. No, that's the only thing architects ever talk about. You know, what is a Greek temple? It's a visualization of the invisible world of the harmony of the universe. Invisible is our business. Nobody likes architects, right? Architects are only brought into situations when people are confused and don't even know what the question is. So architects are called in, they're not paid usually, um, but they're called in to think about something that nobody knows exactly what it is. Um, so, okay, this is a great architectural opportunity to think about the world in or past uh, the cell phone. Um, and, it, you know, maybe there's a million architects um, connected together. Maybe we could come up with something. Maybe. And if not, why don't we just shoot ourselves? Because what else are we doing? Like we're in the boredom business. It's very hard to be mediocre, by the way. It's a professional skill. It's very hard to be consistently boring. And architects are... Um, are pretty good at it. Evangelos, you want to give a few responses? And then before we move, yeah, uh, we give the last word to Hung Hungers, Roger and yeah. Sherry uh, to wrap up. Yeah. Just wanted to add that, you know, we, we often think about uh, architects using various apotropaic devices to fend off demons and, and, and bad forces like the gargoyles in the church. Uh, uh, but we rarely think also of, of the drawings and the projects in that sense. And I think that is precisely what Archigram's work does with regards to the technologies, that it, it, it tries to familiarize us with all these questions and the re repercussions that are coming hand in hand with all these devices and environments. And that's why their work is interesting and will be for a long time, because every time you return to it, you see another television that you didn't see. You see another reference to another kind of uh, distant place you didn't know, uh, another personal connection. And, and, and that's what's... Uh, going to bring more people back, I think, to this work. Yeah. Roger, do you want to say, as a local Hong Kong architect curator, how to yeah. deal with Archigram well, after I think... they come? <laughs> Before they, they come, you have done a lot, right? After they come, what do we do? Well, no, I mean, I think, I think, I think um, this is great. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've taken a lot of notes, so but I won't go through all of them because they'll be here all night. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a lot in it. I mean, I, I think it's interesting in that, that a lot of it, I probably have to sit down and go through it a few more times before I really get what the, the content is. Because I think, but, but, but ultimately, you know, we, 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 we talked from, 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 from the cell phone to, to, to Isosaki and so on. I mean, there's so much material in it. But I think, I think you're right. I mean, the, what I'm very interested in is how we draw all of that discussion and bring it down to ground. The ground being in Hong Kong, 
and and I think I, I'm in a way I'm quite optimistic to, to some extent, even though I agree with everything they that they rebuttal in terms of what I was saying. In that you know, almost by coincidence, I think I think we we actually agreed it isn't whether Hong Kong is or is not an archipelago city that's important. It is how we kind of see the thinking behind it. I mean, it was interesting. I mean, there, it, physically, there were a couple of things that 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 Peter pointed out to you about context in terms of of the you know the three dimensional city and also the 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 the, the, the harbor, which I think I was almost very encouraged by the fact that I'm, 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 we're seeing quite a lot of designers thinking about harbor, thinking about how, how it looks and 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 so on and so forth. So 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 I think I'm I'm full of a lot of um, ideas which I, I'm getting from these and 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 I think. Um, you know, as a springboard to what we do in the next few years, we're together with M plus to Shirley and all the program. I think how can we use these um, uh, 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 the collection to curate programs which are encourage people to think freely and think in a way it, in a way it doesn't really matter what world to live in. In, in, a sense, in in the same way, we don't know where ground zero of COVID is. We don't know um, what it's going to. But armed with that idea, we don't know the answer should give us the courage and the confidence to think outside of what we see in front of us. And, and I think that for me is what I mean by imagination to drive innovation, because don't think about innovation, think about imagination and the innovation will follow. And I think, I, think I, I, you know, I mean, that, that's what I can gather or, or summarize in, in what I got from, from this session. And I think, you know, the more I let it settle, I'm sure the more will come out. And I hope that, that, that you know, I really hope that, that the, 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 um, the M plus uh, having the collection, Archaeum Arche collection in Hong Kong will really drive that. Great. Uh, Shirley, the last word is yours. The babysitter of Archaeum children. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I think this is a yeah again it's a it's a it's a little step what we're trying to do here even trying to allow for this conversation to take place and you have to remind people that the physical archive takes years to catalog and so and before they're able to fully access you know so there have to be other means in which we don't actually depend fully on the physical thing yet and good doing doing it at the same time um and so i just yeah highly stimulated by all of these suggestions but highly challenging at the same time so <laughs> okay so we call it a day in different yeah. time zones. Yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you,